teams are already hugging that left side. We can already see the Arcana Trinket channeled there by Ricky on the side of Paint for Fem. Now, only difference between the two teams is that No Girls Allowed, as we mentioned earlier, is running that Unholy DK for Sistara, whereas it's Double Rogue over there for uh, Paint for Fem. Yeah, so we see a huge pull come in for both teams here. Both of them popping that Bloodlust. You see the healer uh, jumping onto the staircase there just to make sure the Juggernauts are not charging anywhere. And now it's going to be really important to have this uh, focused target damage on the high HP targets. Now, whoever handles bolstering better here will just finish the pull faster. Uh, and that's something we've been talking about earlier with the Unholy DK. You see Sistara actually holding back quite a bit that, uh, in damage. You see he's get, actually getting out DPS uh, by the Protoware, and there comes oh, the damage. What saying? <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> you see how the Juggernauts actually bolster quite a lot, and it really seems like... I mean, they both finish at the, kind of at the same time, right? All right, right? it's still so, early. It's still early. Yeah, they, they finish at the same time, so... Uh, pretty even here. Maybe pain for them slightly faster. Slightly faster, and here come the con uh, the Colossus right now. The Construct pull upstairs. Neither team opting to snap like we saw 40k do earlier. There's actually a couple of different spots you can snap, which is hugely advantageous because it prevents your healer from needing to run around like a maniac, and it also makes the Enchanted Emissary on the side there much easier to deal with. But both teams handling it really well. We can see a nice view here from our Reservers with Edelweiss up on one of those uh, tree or flower plant pots, if you will, making sure that uh, she is immune from the Juggernaut charges and the sit nice and stacked. Now, the key here, as mentioned yesterday, is you want to take care of that Colossus early. It has substantially more health than the trolls around it, and if a troll dies near the Colossus, it will gain a 10% damage buff on top of something that's already doing a lot of damage. That's a very big Colossus, <laughs> as you can see on uh -oh. No Girls Allowed side. Uh, they should still be able to finish it off. There we go. Uh, so no problem at all. They did finish it earlier compared to Pain for Femme, so they're slightly slower here. But both of them doing the exact same pulls, as you can see with the percentage. They're both on 31%. You see the double CC come in here uh, on those two mobs that are standing on top of the staircase. And now we'll see if they do another huge pull here, which uh, is what No Girls Allowed is doing. They also actually gripped in the auger from the, from the staircase mobs. You see, there's some wildfires going through and Dilemma Undead dropping quite low. And Pain for Femme looks like they're doing the same pull. Yeah, they're doing the same pull here, and then the trick uh, with the middle there, there's an Enchanted Emissary. That Emissary is actually not physically tied to uh, the big pack in front of Priestess Alunza, so by pulling it from the side like the two tanks did with that weapon throw, you're able to just extract them out, and then somebody else can kind of just deal with it and punt it on the side. So, Door Girls allowed yet again being first to it, just because of the prowess of the Unholy DK, really. I mean, look yeah. at the damage. They destroy everything in there and are ready to pick up Priestess Alunza already. There's still the Enchanted Emissary on the side. That's no problem for them to just deal with one on the side as we can see Edelweiss working to punt it away with Spam Moonfire. She gets a couple of regrowths off as she goes in. Paint for Femme looking a bit, fair bit slower here. A lot of mismanaging on the bolster. And just look at the health of that one Priestess on the side. She's not even channeling Transfusion, which she can use to reflect the damage back on. So it's a lot of extra health that they have to chew through. Yeah, so there was one Transfusion on, on the Arrested Druid, and he was just too late to step into one of those pools, and therefore it just didn't die early. And then uh, another... A uh, difference for Pain for Femme in this pool was that Miwu, the Arrested Druid, didn't actually jump on any sort of ledge, so the Juggernaut was charging out, meaning that they lost damage on the Juggernaut because of that charge, and therefore the damage was not as even as it could be. While No Girls Allowed had Edelweiss actually stand on one of those uh, lanterns, and therefore the Juggernaut was not charging, and they had way more even damage. So good on No Girls Allowed to find this spot there, while Pain for Femme didn't really bother with it. So it, it cost them... Kind of, a couple of seconds only, but for how close these two teams are right now, it means quite a bit. And No Girls Allowed even did a bigger pool as their 2% ahead in trash. I was just about to say, wouldn't be surprised to see the trash from downstairs uh, near the fire gauntlet pulled by both teams. We saw that popular yesterday. Essentially, once as long as you do the mechanics properly, of course, once the boss is sub 25%, the fight is over because she's going to kill herself with transfusion. So even if you bolster her just a bit, as long as the tank doesn't get gibbed, you're good to go, which is why you see the four pack of trash pulled from the bottom, the double all honor and the double honor uh, the double auger and the double honor guard they're just going to cleave that on top of the boss as primary efficiency and aim to kill everything at the same time transfusion coming up for no girls allowed priestess and loons will die very quickly here paint for femme not too far behind either they still have to deal one more round and uh, they'll be on their way downstairs as the two augers get killed off as well yeah, so Ricky was the one, the Windwalker, who went down to, to pull this trash pack. And it seemed like he took quite a bit to get it uh, pulled. So maybe the boss is going to die before the mobs die, which means that we'll be just a little bit...
little bit less efficient compared to No Girls Allowed, uh, just because uh, Priestess Alunsa is going to die no matter what to the next trans transfusion anyway. So uh, pulling them slightly earlier is an advantage. Just a couple of seconds gained again by No Girls Allowed as they're already on their way to pulling Resan. So no trash in between here. This is straight going to Resan. So uh, important to note that there is, I mean, perhaps not significant, but it could make a difference at the end with the amount of sky screamers they need to do. There is a 2% trash difference between these two equivalent routes, and that is the uh, the auger that you mentioned earlier at the beginning of the zone. So No Girls Allowed has that 2% advantage, and they've already gotten started on Razan. So far, these are completely mirror strategies and pretty typical strategies that we see from uh, teams, at least for the most part. Razan holds here for No Girls Allowed, about to get to 90%, and they have an emissary of tides on top of it with quite a few raptors, and they're trying really hard to play around that unholy DK and feed it as much extra damage funneled into Razan from the AoE cleave. And there's also one interesting thing. No Girls Allowed has a Sky Screamer there in the corner to see it. So they will probably pull it on top of their son at the very end once they're sure that they're not going to bolster him. So uh, just a small little percentage gains from No Girls Allowed. So very smart strategy here. Getting a little bit more percentage compared to Pain for Femme uh, here and there. We actually also see once to see it in Pain for Femme. So never mind. They actually do the exact same thing. Uh, not sure if they're going to pull some more even at the very end. Maybe even more than one Sky Screamer. But yeah, this is the most efficient strategy you can do. Just even with both string just finding those uh, small little percentages you can gain by efficiently just uh, cleaving it down with a, a high hp target like like a boss yeah I, I mean, we saw this yesterday what happens is they needed to get one of the sky screamers down in order to pull the emissary of the tides down to them because uh, the emissary of the tides at the top of the stairs rests between that two pack of sky screamers so they pull one down they crowd control on the side and then they're going to pull the second one down you can kind of see it at the top of the screen there for paint for femme uh, it's just sitting up there they're going to pull the second one down and cleave it along with the boss as you mentioned at the end at least that was a strategy going yesterday for some of the teams. We'll see if they try to replicate that here. No Girls Allowed sits at 63% trash, 45% now on Razan. Paint for Femme, not too far behind. They're only about 10%, uh, well, 10, 11% on Razan, I suppose, is actually quite a bit in this tyrannical affix. But they are, uh, that is the difference between them. And they sit at 4% behind on trash, but they're about to kill the emissary, which will put them to 61. Yeah, so uh, still Paint for Femme slightly behind uh, because of this, uh, because just of the, the better handling of bolstering, really. Uh, at the start, I was talking about the unholy maybe being less efficient with bolstering but it really seems like they're they're um, doing it really well they're calculating the damage really well they're handling bolstering well so good job on no girls allowed so far making up those uh, small little seconds now uh, this boss you can see they just all they have to do is hide around the corner to not get feared and the fixate completely gets avoided by the team by using either shadow melt or vanish to just completely get rid of the fixate and then the boss does not move and you just gain more damage yeah so as uh, stated earlier the two sky screamers are now present here on no girls allowed uh, as Razan's getting cleaved down they got to make sure of course not to kill the sky screamers before Razan dies who's now hit nine percent for no girls allowed so they pulled even further ahead by about uh, 15 16 percent as pain for femme is going in for a second round of cooldowns now and they're looking to chisel down their two sky screamers so once again exactly mirror strategies they just have to make sure to interrupt those sky screamers once every 15 seconds so one melee can handle it completely everything perfectly dies together for no girls allowed who immediately mounts up and starts heading up the stairs yes a pain for femme now also is uh, working on those sky screamers but again m uh, n never mind. they might actually die a little bit too early as you can see six percent is kind of a lot still on a uh, on a tyrannical boss but they definitely try to not finish them early okay so one died right before the boss died so it didn't matter too much well done by pain for femme as well to finish it off but yeah it's like ha half a minute to a minute behind at this point compared to no girls allowed as they are already snapping some of those swords uh, on the side they really want to make sure that you do not bolster any of the sky screamers here you want to make sure that you use the true CC, which is sap by a rogue, uh, and it seems like Pain for Femme was doing it wrong. They actually have one of the uh, skyscrapers here on top of the spool. I mean, wrong or intended, they might or be intended, caught yeah. priority cleaving off of the skyscraper, and they seem to be doing a good job of it. Now, there's technically no, nothing bad about doing this outside of sustained tank damage, right? Because you have just a ton of swords sitting on the tank the whole time instead of cleaving them down. And yeah, you can see exactly why. And Fem goes down. So I guess in the end, it's not the best strategy, at least for tank safety. In terms of efficiency, you get that cleave off, fine, no problem. But the tank gets Gib. Uh, Fem goes down on paint for Fem. He immediately releases. They hold on to their battle rest because he can start at the beginning of the dungeon. And they did actually manage to kill the trash off. So not too much lost, except for that uh, five seconds worth and then rebuffing Fem, etc. So it looks like they're going up to the Volcall wing that we saw yesterday. And they're doing 
in the same pool on top of that Void Emissary, whereas No Girls Allowed is opting to go on a more typical strategy down the bridge with the Swords and Skyscreamers. Yeah, we were talking about this just before the game started, uh, figuring out which strategy strategy is actually faster, because Paint for Fam doing this strategy that we saw by 40k and Abracadabra, where they would deal with the, with this unholy pack, basically, while seeing the Honor Guides. Now, it, it is a little bit of backtracking, because you don't actually need to go this route to go up to Volcal. You could also just go through the middle, and No Girls Allowed just dealing with the Swords instead of doing this, this left undead pack. So we'll see uh, whichever route ends up to be faster. No Girls Allowed already in 84%, and it's already, like, they're almost done with this pack as well. So it really seems like Pain for Fam just falling further and further behind. Yeah, and what's impressive about No Girls Allowed uh, pull here is that they actually combine both Skyscreamers on top of the two Witch Doctors, on top of the two Honor Guards, and then on top of the Stalkers. So they did like a, a rather spicy pull, and it worked very nicely for them. Interrupts were on point, bolstering and kills were on point, Unholy DK carrying damage again to cleave everything down. And now they're at 98% trash, so all they need is that one remaining Sky Screamer at the end of the dungeon that they're probably going to pull into Yasma's room, crowd control on the side, and then just cleave on top of the boss. And here they go, they get started on Volkal, the second last boss that they need to deal with. First phase here, Dilemma getting smashed by the boss, unfortunately, gets <laughs> caught in the swirly. So not what you want to see early on, but it should be all right. As Pain for Femme, not far behind, at least from a boss perspective, only a few percent behind on the totems in phase one, but they have 10% extra trash to do. And that will be the trash at the bottom of the Volkal stairs that we were just commenting that uh, No Girls Allowed did quite well. Yeah, the only way for Pain for Femme to, to catch up here is by either No Girls Allowed making some sort of mistake or Pain for Femme somehow gets their last percentage while fighting the boss. And that's really not going to happen. You can't pull anything on top of Volcal anymore because the gate is closed. And you, I mean, you could pull 12% of trash on top of Yasma, but that's really difficult. And I doubt it's going to happen to be able uh, to cleave it down with this boss, especially since it's bolstering as well. So 10% uh, difference is going gonna, is gonna to make make it here for no girls allowed as they just dealt with the trash uh, a lot more efficient it, it seemed like they were having very similar strats up until this very last point but no girls allowed just doing everything a little bit faster a little bit more efficient and also the last routing seemed more efficient for no girls allowed as well as both of them are work working on volcano right now and paper i'm actually catching up slightly on the boss but it still won't matter just because of the 10 percent difference yeah, I mean, that, that's a lot that they have to deal with at the end. Both teams quite neck and neck, and uh, they did catch up a bit. I mean, they were about 20-30% average totem health behind No Girls Allowed here at the beginning, so uh, now they've mostly matched up the boss health, and obviously both teams holding on to that Bloodlust, not wanting to use it here as we see a shield wall pop for Femme, giving a bit of breathing room for Mule right now. No dispels on the diseases coming out of Ricky or Undead on either side, because DPS greedy brain. Uh, certainly don't want to lose that, so force the healer to heal through it, and that is totally okay with me. Now, the difference between the boss has started splitting here is No Girls Allowed pulls by almost 10% ahead of Pain for Femme. Yeah, so after this boss, No Girls Allowed, as you mentioned before, really only has to get a Sky Screamer that they used to see in a corner on Yasma's room. So nothing they have to do in between the last boss and this one, while Pain for Femme still has to deal with a, tra with a lot of trash. Now, uh, one small thing that is maybe in Pain for Femme's favor a little bit is that there's a little bit of an RP at the very end uh, that won't allow you to access Yasma, but it's only a couple of seconds. So if Pain for Femme somehow manages to kill 10% trash in, in those 10 seconds that you have the RP, then they will be caught up. But there's no way that's going to happen. So definitely still disadvantage for Pain for Femme. And it's also one death as well on top of everything else. Yeah, well, I mean, both teams have to deal with that RP. So um, in fact, No Girls Allowed can get there even faster and start the stair RP. But they can't, I mean, they can't really kill anything during it, right? Because they already have 98% is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, I, absolutely right. Um, well, they could kill this guy's room. But nonetheless, oh, pain, pain for Femme. Yeah, but also Pain for Femme is not going to just have one of the rogues run off by himself. So yeah. uh, either way, they're in a dire situation right now as uh, both teams finish off Volcal at around the same time. So Pain for Femme managed to close that gap, but they have to deal with this trash here at the bottom of the stairs. There's the double stalkers, the double honor guard, double witch doctor, along with that uh, enchanted emissary as well. They do that, but No Girls Allowed is allowed to just cleanly run through, and they're going to move right past this uh, trash pack on the side. We're going to have uh, Trell aggroing everything and then Heroic leaping away, popping a Shadow Meld, and I, ooh, I, I didn't think he got it off for a sec because that sword kept coming, but they managed to do it properly. RP for the stairs has started, as Nagura mentioned, and they start heading up to Yasma. Hopefully none of them get clipped by a spider. It'd be largely embarrassing. 
Yeah, we also saw the Sky Screamer there being pulled by Undead by the Windwalker and no girls allowed outside. Uh, Edelweiss actually is running mass route, so it just makes it a little bit easier to constantly see that Sky Screamer now. Uh, you probably don't want to use a route though, just because the uh, route doesn't make the mob uh, not cast. So the Sky Screamer will still cast a fear if it's rooted, so you probably just have Undead use the Paralyze or the Hibernate by the Raster Druid here in the corner. Now, uh, Ricky actually going down, unfortunately, for Pain for Fam as they're doing one of their skips. Probably didn't get the Shadow Melt off properly, uh, but they have the 100% trash now as well. They will be able to access... Oh, no, the, 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 the rest is not actually in, uh, in range. So Miwoo has to recast the rest, costing them a precious time still. Yeah, I mean, everything is going wrong here for Pain for Femme right now, who I would say was the superior team between the two yesterday, and, and today No Girls Allowed is really showing that they've turned around their mentality from the poor games that they had yesterday. And they're on Yasma already, 70% bloodless, so it still has five seconds left. We see the last Sky Screamer that they need as planned. Uh, crowd controlled with a Paralyzed from Undead in the corner. They're going to pull that at around, I don't know, 10% on Yasma, something like that, and cleave it all down together, assuming everything goes uh, as planned. You can see how close those two teams are, though, right? The Painter Fam, uh, if, pain, if Ricky wouldn't have died there at the very end, uh, Painter Fam wouldn't have engaged the last boss that much later. Of course, those two deaths in, in some other games wouldn't mean as much. But because those two teams are so close to one another, especially here in the Satellas, are, uh, it's still going to end up being a very close match between those two. No Girls Allowed still has to do the Sky Streamer, while Painter Fam actually ha does have the 100% now. Uh, those two deaths definitely going to make a difference as well. And you can also see the unholy damage here. At the very last boss when you have the bloodlust and you have the army and you have all of those big cooldowns from the unholy dk it's a huge amount of burst damage that uh, comes out of it now on longer fights it might fall off a little bit later but you can still see it's a it's a 20 percent difference approximately on the boss and this just means quite a lot on on a uh, tyrannical environment yeah i mean pain for fam is once again closed the gap a bit they have quite good single target damage they're only 13 percent behind now as opposed to the 30 that it was when they first pulled the boss and uh, shella unfortunately just not mastering the five roll <laughs> He's falling just a bit behind Barrow there, but doing what he can is the asthma goes below 50% for Pain for Femme. No Girls Allowed sitting at 35% right now, and they're going to need soon enough to start thinking about dealing with that Sky Screamer. Both teams soon enough are going to have uh, another round of their images on the side, so they're probably going to cleave that down first, and then No Girls Allowed is going to make the move onto the Sky Screamer. Yeah, so out outside of just nuking down the boss here and single target mattering a lot, you also have the Soul Rent. Um, whoever like handles the Soul Rent better will also gain a little bit more damage on the boss, you can see the closer you can pull uh, the soul rent next to the boss, the more of a damage gain it's going to be because uh, if you don't run out of melee range, the rogues can just continue hitting the boss while still just placing the soul rent away. Then you just need to make sure that you rotate the CC properly with the ring of keys, vortex, typhoon coming from the rest of the druids. Now, no girls allowed did engage the sky screamer. Um, they just want to make sure that they don't bolster the boss. We see Edelweiss actually going down, but they have a rest. Thankfully, they have the unholy DK coming through. Now it's only a five seconds difference between the two teams. But it's still not going to matter as No Girls Allowed is going closer and closer and finishing off Yasma. Fem getting down to 5% on his side as well. And Pain for Fem just caught up so much right now. They saw the Sky Screamer to kill here. And Pain for Fem's done. They only have five seconds to finish this off right now. They actually lose the match. Wow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they finish no it off. Girls. Even Method you have a lot of struggle with that yesterday. So uh, first off, we do notice uh, Dilemma is now on a Frost Mage. Trell is now on a Brewmaster. So they still have that debuff. And Shella has switched over to an Unholy DK. Kind of weird that you let go of an Unholy DK when you're planning a large-scale pull at the start. Yeah, so Sarah on the Demon Hunter instead of the Unholy DK. So that's very interesting. We will see what exactly they are planning on doing with this uh, with this Havoc Demon Hunter. Because uh, as we mentioned before, multiple times, Fem actually going down, unfortunately, here for Pain for Fem and Shelly going down too. So they might have to reset the boss completely as two DPS are dead. That there's no way of them getting back up. Uh, huge problems here at the very start for Pain for Fem. And this is the whole reason they were running the unholy DK in their first place, right? So just this pool not working out for them after all of the cooldowns have been used on top of the bloodlust. Huge disaster for Pain for Fem. Yeah, six deaths off the bat. So many mobs close to low health, which is why Fem released and tried to desperately salvage the situation. Mismanagement there uh, completely of damage intake from both the crocodiles that reduce your maximum HP and hit you for a, quite a substantial amount as a tank. And then on top of it, Necrotic too. It was just too much for Fem to handle. Trell managed to stay alive. He obviously had quite a bit of income damage too. The mobs aren't dead here for them, but the power of the Frost Mage allows him to just slowly backpedal Kite like this and have a reset whenever, frankly, he feels like it. But most importantly, avoid a ton of damage coming in from those mobs and a ton of necrotic stacks stacking up. So, so far, yeah, they're missing the Unholy DK, and honestly, the Unholy DK probably
probably would have had all this trash dead by now, but at least they're still alive. Undead, though, proccing she death, just as I said, take my curse, take it. <laughs> it's, yeah, just gotta keep an eye on this uh, on this Havoc Demon Hunter. There must be a specific reason why they're running this. Uh, one thing to note as well is that he's running Nether Walk, actually. So he is running the immunity. Maybe it has something to do with that. Maybe they just really wanted that Nether Walk for whatever reason. Either way, we're just gonna keep an eye on that Demon Hunter just to see what exactly they, they're doing with it. Now, Pain for Fam, they did uh, all go uh, get back to life. Now they are engaging Sand Queen again with some mobs. Now this time around, uh, Shadow probably does not have their cooldown available anymore that they did the first time around, and they also don't have the Bloodlust. So they want to make sure that uh, the same thing doesn't happen again. They need, to, they need to make sure that Fem stays alive with all of those necrotic stacks on top. Yeah, and Sand Queen about to die here for no goes allowed as they finish off an emissary of the tides. You know, the Havoc Demon oh. Hunter, uh, the Havoc Demon, oh, Shelly going down here as well, just this is standard trash. I mean, this is just, uh, this is an absolute mess right now for Pain for Fem. Ricky getting quite low as well. Fem running around desperately with 50 stacks of Necrotic. He goes down. Sanguine still at 78%. Ricky goes down. Mew goes down, and that's another full team wipe here. And the trash was at low percentage for Pain for Fem. So, absolute disaster scenario here for them as no girls allowed has finished off the boss and is in underground in the sewers getting ready to head up to the buff floor but what i was saying is you know maybe one thing with the havoc dh is it, it does provide the only other true cc that exists within prison so they can get past these two mobs perhaps obviously not something they want to do so don't listen to me but that's <laughs> one of the advantages i can think of i'm not sure what they want to do with another walk exactly maybe he's going to tank something temporarily uh upstairs when they try to round everything together but uh a we stun. I'm just throwing things out there. Spell darkness. I'm not sure either way. Uh, maybe just the that. The actually demon hunter. The one thing that you want to bring demon hunter for is not only like the the things we mentioned, but they're very tanky against magic damage because they get less magic damage by default. Uh, then they also have blur, uh, just a 30 30 percent dr on top of having dodge. Then you have uh, nether walk. You have darkness. There's lots of things they have. They have a lot of leech on top of that as well. So maybe it's for the safety. Maybe he wants to tank something, maybe being the cannon as well, being able to survive a bunch of damage while being in the cannon might be worth it as well. Either way, they did pull Jess Hollis through the wall, actually, with the, I think it was the I-beam from Sistara here, so maybe that's also a reason why they're running it. Either way, we're probably just gonna have to ask him unless we see something very interesting. You see this you see there in the back as well, one sheep, one uh, cage, and one sap, so uh, they want to make sure they see as many mobs as possible here, just so Shrell doesn't die to the necrotic sacks. Yeah, uh, interesting for them. Usually we see some teams kind of grab all of that trash, cleave it down first, and then deal with Jess. Now, Jess could have been pulled through the wall from Trell as well, so I'm not sure that was a particular True. advantage uh, from the Havoc, or that's the reason they brought the Havoc kind of thing. Uh, nonetheless, here comes one AoE uh, from them. AoE Fear going out, interrupt as well. Trell does drop his 23 stacks in Necrotic, and Jess Hallis now transitions as well. But we're going to have the trash soon coming on top of them, not just the one around the corner with the Void Emissary there, but also the three that they've crowd controlled and the team heads off and immediately goes up to meet Jess Hallis along the way. So not sure what they're planning here, but if they do a very meaty pull, it could get out of hand pretty quickly for the tank. Yeah, it also, uh, uh, what we didn't mention is the 5% spell damage buff, right? So maybe since they have Dilemma uh, having more spell damage and... They already have the physical buff from Trell anyway. Either way, it seems like a very rounded comp. Uh, if they don't want to, if they don't need the unholy DK damage, then I definitely think this is the way to go. As uh, they're still working on just Halus here, they are in phase two now. So we have Bobby here as well. You see the master actually come out from Edelweiss, which is so helpful here for the tank. You can see all of those mobs just being rooted there in the corner. And we've seen tanks have problems so much here in this fight because of the necrotic, just because you get uh, all of these mobs come in. You have those. Raiders, which don't have a lot of HP, but every auto attack applies necrotic, and it's so hard for the tanks to reset it because the boss can't be deceived. Uh, deceived sorry, and then uh, you can't really kite all of those mobs because there's not much room either, since you always have to line offside. We saw uh, now, even from Method, you go down to necrotic stacks. So having this mass route here and a well out thought strategy by by No Girls Allowed really it goes in their favor here. Yeah, I'm actually really liking this. This is a really clever yeah. play from them. They're already at 23% trash. They really don't need anymore with all the cannon play that they're going to do upstairs mass pulling there they have you know some teams have even been doing so much cannon play that they're even uh, skipping some of the trash right before night captain valeri so they certainly don't need 
all the trash in the corner there. So they're just going to end up uh, shadow melding it off, going upstairs. So I think they might wait for one more route just to refresh it before heading upstairs. And then they're going to, oh, actually, they're going now. So they're going to skip that and everything once they get to the, uh, the cannon area. So really nice play from them. Undad, though, almost going down along the way. He got a, a bit overzealous and went in ahead of Trell, pulling some of the trash dip down to 1%. And he doesn't have cheat death available. So that could have been pretty disastrous there, but managed to avert the death as pain for Femme. Finally getting themselves back in the game. Femme running around right now through the sewers with the rest of the team as they have killed the Sanquin are heading upstairs to the buff floor. So, but, I mean, pain, uh, pain for Femme is so behind right now compared to the rest of the group. Dilemma, though, doesn't make it upstairs, and Edelweiss barely makes it up. Her undulating ties procs along the way, and she's forced to rest Dilemma now. And that was a very scary skip coming in here by No Girls Allowed. That could have been a disaster if Edelweiss would have went down. Uh, really hard for, there to, uh, for her to come back at this spot, especially if you don't have Shadow Melt available. And stealthing doesn't really work as well just because there's so many true side mobs uh, in the way. So good on them to have Edelweiss to survive and just get the rest up on Dilemma. You see, they're dealing with the uh, Void Touched Emissary now and a bunch of trash. So everyone's dropping very low. They want to make sure that they're line of siding the next AoE as it just does so much damage. And Edelweiss is a, a hard time keeping up the whole group here. Yeah, the problem there is that Edelweiss, Sestara, and Dilemma all got hit by the frontal suppression fire from one of the Marines, which is an absolute no-no. It snapshots your direction. And I guess it targeted Trell, who then uh, Chi torpedoed away from it, and the rest of the team just didn't notice and then got clipped by it, which is why everything seemed so unstable there for a moment. So really making Edelweiss's life just a bit tough, but they managed to uh, stabilize as they pull everything back into the hallway before the cannon balcony so that Trell can get himself in a prime position to get in this room and pull as much trash as possible, bringing it back towards the room. Now, we have Mass Root, we have Ring of Peace, and we have a Frost Mage. Their control here, as far as the, uh, as far as, <laughs> that could have been bad, uh, <laughs> as far as the balcony is concerned, should be supreme. It doesn't get really better than this. Yeah, this was a very and, dangerous, and an yeah, this was a very dangerous pull to do by Trell here. He was already low when he walked in, just using that speed potion, and then when he transcended back up, there were a couple of volcanoes there. Thankfully, he did manage, oh, he's going down there. They do have a battle rest available, so they should get him back up, but this means that all of the mobs are actually kind of spread out, as you can see right now, and Anna didn't really get any shots out yet while they're already sped this might cause a lot of problems for them because look at how many mobs there are and if you don't kill them fast there's so much a we damage going out this is a full team wipe this is a full team wipe and the huge misplay here is that they kept the emissary of tides in the trash so it ran around immuning all of the crowd control that i had just very eloquently planned out for them so you know, everything. The, the Ring of Frost didn't work, as you saw. Blizzard slowing didn't work. AoE stun from Sistar didn't work. Mass Root didn't work. So that Emissary of Tides was their complete undoing, causing a full team wipe here on an otherwise massive attempt and massive skip. So now they have to redo that entire thing. Uh, I don't know. They do have the Shadow Melt available, so they're able to kind of just reset and go again. Undead just getting clipped along the way, so there's another silly death. Another five seconds plus the rest time on the board, allowing Fem to slowly paint for Fem to slowly catch up, who is now on the second phase of just how yeah, so um, they have to do the same pull again, I believe, since, I mean, that's their strategy, right? They want to gather up all of those mobs and they want to kill it with the with the cannons. I'm not completely sure if any of the cannon shots have been used. I don't think uh, so. I don't think so either. Uh, thankfully, they were, they had this in mind that something went wrong for sure, right? Either the mass route from Edelweiss didn't come on the on the emissary or some other CC was missing. So they called it out on voice chat immediately and said, hey, don't use any of the cannon shots because they need them. There's only five shots in each cannon and if they want to get rid of all of this trash that they just pulled, then they need those shots because now all of them reset. So if they wasted any of those shots before, it would have been a disaster and they couldn't have done the pull again. So this time around, uh, they, they try to gather everything up again. Trell is going inside and they just try to same thing again. Yeah, I I'm curious to see because the pull overall was fine in, in terms of getting everything, gathering it up and getting it in the doorway. Everything fell apart with that Emissary of Tides in there, so I'm not really sure what their plan around that is. Uh, we'll see if they even have one as uh, Trell starts face tanking some of the trash in the doorway here, gets one of the suppression fires and is really having a struble staying alive. Ablative's already popped for him. Only six stacks of Necrotic as he a line of sights Edelweiss just a bit there. He's trying to dance in and out of the doorway because what happens is the suppression fire that comes from the Marines, if it fails to cast because your line of sight at the very last second, it will 
will just recast it, so he's trying to avoid that. But at that point, he was line of sighting his healer so much that it almost caused him to die. So that he should just eat the suppression fire and have the healer dispel it then. I think there was still like yeah, very min maxing coming out of trial here as he just was dancing in and out of the line of sight as you mentioned. So uh, thankfully he did manage to survive. They still have two battle rests, so they could get the tank back up. But things fall apart so fast in this cannon area. As soon as your tank or your aggro target goes down, everything is spread out, and uh, it looks like they're really just waiting from so for some sort of cooldowns to come back up because uh, those are not enough mobs for uh, Undead to use the cannon shots on. So not completely sure what their plan is. Maybe they just want to deal with those mobs first without the cannon shots and then try this pull again that they tried earlier. Either way, there's something missing that they don't have anymore that they used the first time around when they wipe. It's so they don't want to try it again before those mobs are down. Now, Pain for Fem also managed to down um, Jess Hallis now at this point, and they're also trying to do the cannon area now. And this at this point, I mean, Pain for Fem not behind anymore. They are ahead in trash. Uh, it's still death difference, right? You still have those four deaths. But if no girls allowed us and start with their with their cannon pull soon, then they might fall even further behind. So I, I think what happened is Dilemma's actually having some internet issues right now, which is why he's hanging out on the side. I thought he was waiting for his cold snap. It was the only cooldown that they didn't have available, but he's just back now. He's having some issues. Trell ends up going down. Undad goes down. Uh, Dilemma, I think, is back in now. He's having his own issues, so just a lot of disaster here for No Girls Allowed. Some misplaying, some just unlucky. Pain for Femme jumping on this opportunity as they start setting up their balcony attempt as well. They've killed the uh, Void emissary on their side they're cleaving down all of the trash uh, at least uh, the beginning trash that we see no girls allowed doing here and then they're gonna get ready to go on the big pull as well yeah, so unfortunately, No Girls Allowed did not manage to do this pull uh, with uh, their member missing, with their mage missing. And it's just, you can actually see how difficult this trash is without doing it with cannons. Of course, they had one less member because the Lama is having issues, right? But you still saw uh, Undead and Star doing so much damage to those officers and this trash, and it just has so much HP, and it's so hard to deal with if you don't use the cannons. That's why whenever you don't use the cannons, you just want to completely skip this cannon part because those mobs are just so difficult to deal with. So if you do anything, wrong with the cannons and you waste any of your cannon shots and you just have to finish off the trash with your own damage, then you, it causes so many problems. Now, uh, Pain for Fem is also doing a cannon pull here. Fem dropping very low, has a lot of necrotic stuffs already, and now they start using their CC to use the cannons. Yeah, and I mean, they don't have nearly as much control as uh, the side of No Girls allowed. They don't, well, they don't have the Frost Mage, really, was what it comes down to. They also don't have an AoE stun, uh, an extra AoE stun from the Havoc Demon Hunter. They, of course, have the Shockwave from Fem, but they have a Typhoon, they have an Ursul's, and they have the Ring of Peace coming in from Ricky with some spot attempts there, but they do it quite perfectly. They funnel everything into the room almost perfectly. A couple of mobs leak through, but they're at 76% trash. They still have their 11 deaths on the board from the double wipe on the first boss, uh, plus Fem releasing wants to try and salvage one of the pulls, and uh, that's pretty much most of the difficult part done for them. They still need to get to around 89 or 88% trash before killing Night Captain Valeria, or for after killing Night Captain Valeria. That's the amount of trash you can have done before killing the last five mobs. So that should be it that they need here, most of the trash. And I think they're gonna skip that Night Captain Valeria's trash. Yeah, so Miwoo unfortunately being silenced by this chain and Fem dropping very low. The Ironbird come out, comes out of Miwoo here just to make sure that Fem Club does stay alive. And uh, they dealt pretty well with the first cannon, but now the mobs are pretty spread out once there are the second cannon here. So they want to make sure that they somehow gather them. Ricky actually going down too. They have one battle rest available, but Miwoo getting silenced again by this chain, so he can't cast a battle rest. Uh, he's trying to, to see some of those mobs just to be able to get them gathered up again. The Vortex coming out too, but the Fem going down, this might be a a huge problem for them. And right on cue, Paint for Fem throws the ball right back in No Girls Allowed Court, who's trying to salvage the rest of their pull. Now, they've kind of had to split up their mass pull into several parts because of the issues that they were having. So they're at 49% trash, which is well over what you would do with the full pull. They've killed some of the trash outside while waiting, etc. Now we can see Troll's gone back into the jail area, done most of the mass pull. He's transcended back into the doorway and is waiting for them to catch up as Sistara. I have no idea where he is, but he saw somehow got killed by something and needed to release immediately. So that's an extra death on the board, plus a DPS and control missing for the mass pull coming in. Uh, we have Ring of Peace available from Trell whenever he's ready to drop it down, though. You know, I think what happened was that Sistara, I think they're dividing the pull, that Trell is taking one half of the room, and Sistara is actually taking the other half with Netherwalk, as you also, not only are you immune to damage in Netherwalk, but you also have increased movement speed. So once you gather all the mobs and you use your Netherwalk properly, maybe they were, maybe that was their plan, to have him pull the 
the other half. But uh, Cesara somehow going down uh, before the nether walk uh, or after the nether walk was used. Either way, it is on cooldown, and Cesara went down twice. So now the mobs are nowhere to be seen because they were aggroing him, and uh, this is going to cause a huge problem for them again. But uh, at least we have Dilemma back. And speaking of going down, Paint for Femme having a full team wipe again. So they're at 20 deaths right now. I mean, No Girls Allowed is trying to help them out by having their own issues, but Paint for Femme is just not taking the bait right now as they fully wipe. They go down to Jess Halas's area and need to run all the way back up because, of course, everybody released. I don't even know if they have uh, Shadow Melts available. They don't. Femme doesn't have it. Mew doesn't have it. Vera doesn't have it. Uh, the only two that uh, have it are actually uh, Shella is the only person that has it. So they're going to need to just manually kill some trash before doing another big skip and getting back to the cannon area, which is such a shame because they killed most of the tough part of the balcony. They're already at 77% trash. So now they're going to probably get over count or at least not have to deal with any more cannon play by killing the trash downstairs here while No Girls Allowed is again trying the same pull from the hallway. Sistara is back up now and he has once again used his nether walk. Okay, so this is a huge problem. So Cesara is trying to pull this trash that is in front of the next boss, right? In front of the next boss, there's a, a bunch of trash mobs, and he's trying to pull them over uh, while Trell is doing the pull inside. But he doesn't have a nether walk ready anymore, and he keeps getting silenced uh, by, by the mobs. And then he gets slowed as well because he's silenced, and then he just dies to melee attacks or to any other attacks from those mobs. So the pull that they're trying to do is just not working out for them anymore. Now, uh, Cesara, they're just going to do this, uh, this side of the mobs here and just leave the other side for now, finishing it off with the cannon, and then they somehow need to deal with the rest of the mobs, uh, either without cannon shots, or I'm not completely sure what they're going to do with it, but uh, the strategy they were trying to do is not working out anymore. This isn't the first time we've seen a handcuff cause a failure on a mass multi-part pull like this. Uh, Abercadabra had a lot of issue with this, with the Divine running around and getting handcuffed as well. The handcuffs it's a six second channel, and if it successfully hits you, six second channel, you're slowed, and you're completely pacified. So Demon Hunter trying to nether walk and fell rush away, uh-uh, you ain't fell rushing anywhere. So he gets caught, he gets killed. I mean, it's just, it's such a risky strategy, and it hasn't paid off, what, twice now? So Star's died, I think, three or four times doing it uh, twice over. So 13 deaths now for No Girls Allowed. They have managed to get some kind of pull going here as Pain for Femme is dealing back with the second cannon on the balcony before Night Captain Valeria. They finally kill that off. They're, of course, over count for trash. They're at 93%, unless they plan on skipping the trash outside of uh, uh, Corgus at the end of the dungeon, which uh, they might be. It looks like they're actually pulling even more. So they might get their 100% count here and then just shadow meld right after Night Captain Valeria and start on the last boss. Yeah, they could have skipped this trash, which is something we've seen from Abra, right? But none of them had the shadow meld ready except the rogue. And uh, I think. I mean, the shad was ready, but uh, there's two side mobs in there as well, so uh, they just couldn't get past this one. And uh, as you mentioned, they can still just skip the trash after after this boss, after Valyrie, so maybe that's what they're choosing to do. But killing this trash without any sort of cannon help is definitely going to take quite a while. And they still have a lot more deaths compared to No Girls Allowed, as they're up to 20 deaths. So still a, a big time difference for, uh, in favor of No Girls Allowed. And uh, No Girls Allowed still has a bunch of cannon shots left as well, so maybe there's a chance that No Girls Allowed can still catch up. Both of them have the Bloodlust available, but it's not really worth it to use it in this cannon area because, again, most of the mobs are getting dealt with with the cannon shots, and the cannon shots don't get any damage boost from the Bloodlust, of course. And, and I mean, even Pain for Fem, they're letting full Riot Shield channels go out from the officers, which decrease damage taken from all surrounding mobs by a substantial amount. There's just so much time loss for this kind of sloppy play. And they're sitting at 98% trash. They're not even done trash, so they're going to have to kill, I guess, the first Marine or something in the next pack before heading up to Corrigus. Either way, they are, in terms of raw speed, ahead in the dungeon. They've already started Night Captain Valyria. They're about 20% of No Girls Allowed, but they have an extra 35 seconds that they need to make up. Now, one big difference, and is very important to note, is that No Girls Allowed is only at 82% trash. They need to be at 88 or 89 in order to fully kill the remainder of the balcony before uh, Corrigus at the end of the dungeon in order to get their 100%, which means that they're, they need to backtrack at some point, Nagura. Yeah, so that's going to be a huge problem for them. I assume it has to do with um, with their failed pulls over and over that happened inside the house, where Trell was going, trying to go in, and then they had a huge wipe going on. So maybe they were just they had to pull less in order to just 
finish it off and therefore they are missing some trash. You see, there's actually some mobs coming in here. There's an office. There's a couple of officers alive. So this might just be the trash that they still need and they're all really low HP. There's a couple of handcuff casts going out with a huge, uh, really good AOE stun coming in by Cesar here just to make sure that it is interrupted. So yeah, they're up to 88% now. So good on them to just immediately go to Valeri while still having those mobs alive and just slowly killing them while uh, bursting down the boss. So this is going to be a, a very close race still. Pain for them. Again, missing those two percent, so it's going to be very inefficient for them to get this last percent. Because even if they single target down one of the mobs, it's just going to take. It's, it's going to be inefficient. It's going to take them almost the same amount of time as No Girls Allowed needs to cannon down their twelve percent. Yeah, not the best movement there from uh, Fem with the boss boss staying in the middle of the room, completely covered by one of the explosive barrel circles. So none of the melee had access to that. On top of they had to emergency move some barrels. So Shella had to completely duck out of the boss and help move barrels along with Mew before getting back. So a bit of damage lost there. Allowed No Girls allowed to catch up just a few percent. Now the difference between the two teams is only about 15. Uh, it was 20 at the beginning. Pain for Femme done with Night Captain Valeria here, understandably, as they uh, pulled the boss first. They only have 2% trash to deal with. There are five mobs here plus a Void Emissary. I'm not sure what they're going to kill or what they want to kill. If they're even going to kill anything, maybe they just back out at the end of the dungeon and use Nathanos to port down to the beginning and uh, pull one more uh, piece of trash. But, I mean... I don't know. A, maybe pull a warden in at, at the, the very end. end yeah, right? they that, might that do that. We've something. seen that before from the teams, but they should pull it early if that's the case. Although both wardens pull, I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to see. But bloodlust popped here for pain for Fem as they uh, get started on overseer Corgi right now. Ninety percent already on the boss. This boss shouldn't give too much trouble. It is fortified version. It's really only the tyrannical that gets out of hand. No girls allowed. They did have the amount of trash percentage that they needed, but they still have to deal with this uh, balcony here. Yeah, there's a huge single target burst coming out of Ricky and Shella. Both of them just having insane amount of burst coming out with the Blalas being popped as well and all of the cooldowns that they have saved up until this very moment. Unfortunately, they did get a double cast here. So uh, double cast with the explosive burst is not going to cost you a wipe probably just because it's fortified and there's no other affixes making this more difficult. But it means that your healer can do less DPS. So that is going to be a problem because this is going to be a very close race between those two teams. So uh, having couple of doubles, meaning the healer can do less DPS. Now, unfortunately, the Dilemma went down for No Girls Allowed, but they now managed to get their 100% trash on their side. Yeah, I'm not really sure what Dilemma was doing. He ran into one of the Wardens while it was doing its ground pound, essentially, its ground AoE in the swirling. It just one-shot him. I mean, he was going in there for a Frost Nova or something, but nonetheless, uh, it, I mean, to finish him off, silly death, an extra five seconds on the board, which, frankly, I don't really think they can afford at this point. Uh, yeah, they have 30 seconds extra to kill this boss off, but Feinper Femme is already at 30% on the boss. Now, I think so, something will be the undoing here. It'll either be that death on Dilemma at the end, or it'll be the 2% that Pain for Femme needs. Let's ignore the 20 deaths for them as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it really might be a big deal that they still need this 2%, because no matter what, they have to single target something down, or go into the cannon and finish something up, but there's a Void Emissary, and that might cost them to wipe. Femme actually going down here to one of the uh, AoEs cast from the boss, unfortunately. They have a rest to get him back up, so they might be re recovering here, but another 5 uh, seconds on top of the board, and no girls allowed. Uh, seems like they have a lot of single target damage as well. They had their Bloodlust available, had all their cooldowns. So they're going to be catching up in, in boss DPS as well. Yeah, and Ricky going down here for Pain for Femme as well. At the end, that's a, the, another battle res gone, but another five seconds on the board. Plus the few seconds, of course, of DPS that you miss, even needing to get that GCD down. The DPS is dead. So Overseer Korg is here, 5% for Pain for Femme. 45% for No Girls Allowed. No Girls Allowed is done with the rest of the dungeon, though. So as soon as Corgus dies, they're good to go, and they have 40 seconds to do so. Femme, uh, immediately they turn around, they go over to the Warden, and they head downstairs to the cannon. I don't think they even care what mob they kill, as long as they pound five shots into anything here. Probably the Priest will be the best target to do so. They get full CC, cannon shot after cannon shot are poured into the Priest, but I think they missed one cannon shot on one Priest and started hitting the other Priest, so not sure what's going on there. As Overseer Corgus, it's 27% for No Girls Allowed. Yeah, so this is, this is probably going to be No Girls Allowed. They still don't have the 100% the on paper from side. They have oh. another two deaths from the Viltex Emissary. No Girls Allowed already has the time advantage, and uh, it's just going to be them finishing it off. I mean, No Girls Allowed had so many problems and was trying to like almost gift the win to Pain for Femme, but they're just having even more problems, and it's going to be No Girls Allowed who are going to win this 2-0. I mean, this is... This is... This was some. This was this was a dungeon. <laughs> this, this was a dungeon between the both teams, and I, I mean, no girls allowed. You know, yeah, they're gonna take it 2-0. But uh, I, I was just giving them love in the last game that they turned around.
let's get it going in Waycrest. Yeah, so they're actually playing the same comp as yesterday, I believe. I think we had Sally and Among as well. We definitely did have the Blood Decay and the Hunter last time around too. So they are not changing up their comp. Uh, the last time they, they lost the Waycrest banner actually to Abracadabra because they were they had a huge wipe in the hallway later on in the Ral room. So otherwise their, their, their strategy seemed fine and their comp seemed fine. Uh, it's just a little bit of a disadvantage because they didn't have the unholy AOE burst that, that those other teams had. Now, 40k on the other hand, they're playing more of a standard uh, standard comp, but they also have the Demon Hunter in there with the darkness and the magic uh, magic resistance, basically, just to survive all of those bursting stacks and the random AOE that is happening in this dungeon. Yeah, I kind of want to call it Zelia here because this is the third third healer class he's played this tournament. He's yeah. played Druid, he's played Disc Priest, and now he's playing Monk as well. You know, maybe you can go for the World Tour if you can get a little bit of Paladin and Resto Shaman action in the entire <laughs> tournament. He could probably be the first healer to ever play all of the available specs for his class. Actually, you'd have to play Holy Priest as well, so that's probably not going to happen. But, I mean, it just goes to show you just kind of the prowess of these top-end players. They can, they can play every spec pretty much equally. Maybe not quite as good as their main, but we're talking like 95% effectiveness. These guys are insanely good at multi-classing. They can play pretty much any class in the game. So it's just cool to see that within the within the, uh, the scope of just one weekend. They can do a lot of with, with, these, with these classes that they... Mine is, might not be as familiar on as their mains. Now, of course, uh, the interesting thing here, I think, so far, is Method EU has opted to use their Bloodlust on this first boss while they're pulling trash into it, just for a little bit of extra effective cleave damage. Normally, what we see from most teams is they kind of commit to only having two Bloodlusts in this dungeon, where they'll use their first Bloodlust on some massive pull in the courtyard in, in, instead of using it on the boss. But actually, as I mentioned, that 40k ends up popping their Bloodlust on pretty much the same thing. They end up pulling some trash on top of the boss here. Yeah, so they pulled the Captain and the Guard here from the hallway on top of the Acolyte pack here on the left. So this is a pretty difficult pull, especially on the tanks, because those Guard and the Captains do a lot of tank damage. You can see Rentari dropping super low from not only the damage from the bosses and the mobs, but also having the bursting stacks on top of everything. So well done by 40k to finish this off, and that's why they were saving their Bloodlust for later and not just popping it on the pull, just because this is so such a difficult trash pack to handle on top of the boss. And then the very first sister that is enabled, a Sister Solena, actually, does have a 50% healing reduction aura, and then that's not when you want to pull trash on top and have uh, so much damage and bursting while also healing 50% less. Yeah, but and neither of these teams having any issue dealing with this boss as well. 40k getting it down first, of course, but Method EU has pulled both trash packs. Actually, actually, both teams have pulled both trash packs on top of the boss. Similar uh, trash counts for both teams. So, yeah, 40k just being a little bit faster right now, and you can see a lot of that has to do with the Unholy DK just being able to cleave, you know, turn that AoE trash pull into extra boss damage. Unholy DK was doing something like 80k while everyone else was doing 55 or 60k. So you can just see how good, in general, that DPS spec. And I think we called them out a little bit for that on the side of Method EU, where we, we didn't mind their comp too much. We just thought as long as they threw an Unholy DK, they could pretty much do any of the pulls as fast as any other team, because that's really the one class right now that kind of just does more damage than everything else because of how their class works. Yeah, definitely. It's just the fact that they... I think there was also a reason why they had one of those wipes they had the last time around in Waycrest, uh, because they were doing one, uh, those huge pulls in Ral, in Ral's area with all of those maggots and uh, the gorgers. And if you're missing this huge AoE burst that is coming out of the Unholy, then things just go dire, and it's, it's so much more difficult to deal with it the longer they're alive. So without having this huge AE burst, this huge problem is coming in for them there. But 40k doing a pretty decent pull there. Miss uh, Igloo actually dropping, uh, uh, proccing his staff there uh, as they all dropped very, very low. But no one went down, so they did recover. Now they do this Void Touched Emissary pull. We keep talking about this one, and there's going to be huge amounts of bursting stacks, uh, but we see the darkness actually not act not being used yet by LaSalle, uh, but he's going to uh, use it very soon once, this, uh, once all of these mobs go down. Yeah, I'd imagine he's, there it is on the ground right now. Just like you mentioned, darkness going down just to try to dodge as many of these stamina coming out as possible. We'll have to see if they're able to dodge any of the bursting stacks, but, you know, it's kind of an RNG ability. I believe, I don't, I'm not quite sure what the, what the percentage chance on darkness is, of course. It's 50, but I might is be Is it 50%? Wrong. I, I believe it's a pretty high percentage chance just to dodge any damage. Unfortunately, it didn't go so well for them. Two deaths on the board, and Misty's dropping lowest to heal himself up. Ooh, the bursting refreshes. Uh, I think it should be fine. It's only a two stack. But yeah, two deaths on the board, just not the cleanest... Uh, not the cleanest execution on that pull, unfortunately, but, you know, it's not a full team up. They'll be able to get, get a res up, but just, you know, it's two, two deaths on the board. And when we're talking about this this comp that Method is running, they're not necessarily going blazing fast. We were talking yesterday, like, their, their absolute best time with this comp versus, like, you know, their their absolute ideal comp is probably going to be maybe, you know, a minute and a half to two minutes slower throughout the entire dungeon, let's say 10% slower in general. 
and they're kind of just hoping to not make any mistakes and beat you that way. They're not they're not going to outspeed you if you're playing perfectly. Yeah, and it really looks like, I mean, if you look at the percentage here on the trash, uh, Method U, once they're down with this trash, they are going to be ahead to 40k. So uh, it seems like Method U weren't doing those flashy big pulls that 40k was doing, but sometimes three pulls is not that much slower than two pulls if the two pulls require you to have a huge setup time, have a, have a huge like downtime because you need to rest people up afterwards because there's so many bursting stacks. And it, if the setup time and everything just takes too long on those flashy big pulls, then sometimes not even that much slower to go uh, with three pulls like Method E was doing on their side. So they did, didn't actually lose that much at all by going a little bit slower here as both of them are engaging Soba and Goliath. We did pull um, the mini boss to the right side here for both teams. Uh, I believe it was both of the rogues just pulling it to the side, then vanishing off the aggro just so they don't have to deal with the mini boss. It's really interesting to see after after this entire year of uh, Wavecrest Manor pulls to see teams still doing different cap comps. I, I, I remember seeing yesterday one of the teams just decided to pull the mini boss plus trash just on top of Soulbound Goliath and cleave it down. I don't remember which team that was off the top of my head right now, but I, I remember in, Wa in Wavecrest Manor, especially in the spring season, we had like a figured out route where in Team D kind of. Uh, prior to, they, they, they debuted that in their first weekend and every other team just copied that because it was almost a perfect route. Now when we've swapped the dungeon over to Fortified, we've, we've changed some of the affixes up in here. We've got Beguiling now. Teams have just completely changed their routing up. It's, it's awesome to see just new strategies come out from the teams. Yeah, most definitely. You also see, uh, because you have Goliath tanked in this different spot here right in front of the doors, it's so much easier for them to pull trash out of these rooms and just cleave it down with Goliath, which is something we've seen multiple times this weekend by those teams. Uh, of course, Goliath is not one of the easiest bosses to deal with just because there's a lot of AE damage going on whenever you do drag him into the fire. And then on top of... Uh, with the Mistweavers instead of the Rasta Druids, there's a, a high chance that uh, the, the Mistweavers are actually getting into this, the Thorn cast by the boss because they're not able to just completely shapeshift it and immune the cast. So if you pull trash on top and your healer gets, uh, gets thorned in a bad situation, that might be causing some issues. But as long as they're in proper position, it should be no problem for the damage dealers to get them out immediately. Yep, I just I believe I just saw an instance of the focusing arrows coming out from one of the players. It wouldn't surprise me if it was on Mirez, but I remember yesterday all three DPS from Method E were running Blood of the Enemy. I want to take a look at the app here in a second, the, the, the Wowhead extension app, just to keep an eye on what that is. Maybe it was an I-beam that I saw, but I'm pretty sure it was blue and orange. That's the essence of the focusing arrows colors, which is interesting because usually in these dungeons, you kind of don't really want to see that. That's, that's sort of an inefficiency of damage, right? That you really only run essence of the focusing arrows if you really have to do as much AoE damage as possible. And in a dungeon, a dungeon like Wakecrest Manor, when you're five bosses. I mean, this is the only five boss dungeon in the game. You kind of expect teams to be going for uh, single target damage. Yeah, it might also... Uh, I mean, there's also lots of trash they pull on top of bosses. Uh, so maybe because they don't have the Unholy DK, they need this extra AoE because it's... Uh, it's I don't know. Uh, because it's explosive as well. So the longer the longer the mobs are alive, the more explosive or d the higher the chance is for more explosives to spawn. Either way, uh, huge amounts of AoE damage they need as well as, uh, of course, as well as single target. We see Mirror is actually doing a lot of AoE here. Uh, Mirror is trying to replace that Unholy a little bit with the damage. But obviously, it's going to be hard to, to compete with those 1.5 million DPS bursts that sometimes those DKs uh, are pulling off. Now, 40k, they're already working on on this next trash pack with the Void Touched Emissary. They didn't have enough damage to finish it off before the uh, second AoE cast, but uh, since it's in this corner here, here, it's very easy to just line off side the cast as well, which is what they were doing. Yeah, it's actually Jimmy, uh, Fragments on that Demon Hunter running essence of the Focusing Arrows. I don't think I've ever seen that before, so I, you know, I don't know Demon Hunter too well. I don't know about... Uh, oh. oh, hold that thought. Zelia going down instantly to this trash pack. The only battle rose is on now, so he's going to have to use the Renew Power to res him up there. Problem with this is Zelia is really low on, on mana now, so he's going he's to be really... It's going to be really difficult for him to keep everyone up, and you can see there's three spit debuffs on now right now. He's just dropping incredibly low on this pack, fortunately able to heal himself out of it. You can see just how much self-healing that that Blood Decay can do. He's up at 90k self-HPS right now on this trash pack. It's actually actually ridiculous how much self-healing he's doing. Not only that, but he's doing a pretty significant amount of damage, too. That was really spooky. Unfortunately, that was their only battle was available. They'll have another one up in 45 seconds, but, you know... Uh, the fact that they didn't actually just fully wipe on that pull without their healer is pretty impressive. Now, a couple of residual effects of that, because Zelia was, was low on mana when he came up, he did end up proccing his staff, so he's not going to be able to build up any stacks for the rest of the dungeon. Not only that, because he's Oom right now, they might have problems with these bursting stacks at the end of the pull here, but I don't believe that these give any bursting stacks after spawning later on. They just have to keep an eye on these 50 buffs. Yeah, Genji, 50 buffs. three, Genji, uh, how is he not proccing his cheat death? This is insane. Yeah, it was actually a, 
that was, as, oh, he as he mentioned, uh, really, really well recovered. Uh, they actually stopped damage completely after they had the first three or four bursting stacks because Sally obviously was completely ohm, right? So you saw them kill off three mobs and then immediately stop damage because Sally, uh, there was no way he could have healed more than three or four bursting stacks because of his of him just being ohm. So well done by them to recover this pull. And Maris also just immediately uh, using that turtle to not die to those bursting, bursting stacks. But now going down uh, immediately as soon as the mobs come up to him. And this is what happened earlier as well. Ken went down immediately on the very first uh, the very first second of the pool and this time there's no way for them to recover this because now is the only one with a, with a battle rest so if he goes down there's no way for them to get him back up so they have to uh, have a full reset and a full uh, release going in and this is the same thing that happened to them yesterday as well where they had this exact same full team wipe coming in in this area yeah now just completely flopped they're like yeah. 100 to zero instantly he he just fell over. There's not a whole lot he can do there. And also, these guys, it looks like they don't have their shadow modes available, so they just ran through everything with their shadow modes on cooldown. Are they just planning on... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what they plan on doing. Uh, to be honest, I, I, well, hopefully they have a way of skipping the trash, but it's just going to follow them throughout the dungeon. I'm not really sure what the plan is here. Maybe they're going to have Zelia go down and battle res him here? That's, that's what I would assume they're going to do, but uh, maybe they're just going to go ahead and pull it with trash and AoE it down. No, he just <laughs> now just dies again. What, what are they... What? I'm I'm lost for this right now. <laughs> that was that was I mean, there's no way for them to actually skip this trash anymore, right? Because uh, they don't have to. Sh actually, they do have the shroud available, but there's a true side mobs. There's a void emissary there as well that they can't really go past. So they don't have the shadow melt available. So the only way for them to to go to this area that they came from is what you mentioned to have Sylia die and have now rest him back up and then mass rest the whole group. So that's the only way to them for them to go past this. Uh, and now we see them actually have the shadow melt back up or very close to having the shadow melt back up. So as long as Sylia does get it off, then he can then rest the members who don't have. It ready so uh, now they are finally back but those were some very unnecessary deaths they really did not need uh, to have this this wipe happen there they could have just waited for uh, either forming a plan in in their voice chat and figure out what they do or they were waiting for for the shadow melt either way something went wrong there s40k is already fighting ral and they're on 74 percent trash so they're really far ahead now yeah, i mean the two full wipes on the side of method you have just given this thunder to 40k they've tossed the ball over and they said hey you guys this is your dungeon to win don't mess this up and i mean they're definitely Definitely taking advantage of it. They, they've dealt with Rawls Room very, very cleanly. We saw some of the more safer pulls out of 40k, where you'll pull half of Rawls Room on its own, and then you'll pull the rest of that half of the trash with the boss. Because with the Unholy DK, you can't really control your bursting too much. When you pull the entire room, they just kind of do a ridiculous amount of AOE damage and can't control it too much. So the the fact that they're going for the safer route, not going for the crazy bursting stacks, and even then, when they pulled half the room there, I think the most bursting stacks I saw them get was three or four. Like they, they're doing a very good job of dealing with these affixes in this dungeon. Looks like the pull's finally going down from Method EU, third time's the charm it looks like, now not instantly going down this time. So yeah, it looks like they've got it kind of figured out, but they're really going to have to hope for something uh, poor to come out of 40k here to have any chance of coming back in the dungeon. Yeah, and 40k, they still have their bloodlust available as well, so they can do any sort of huge pulls they want to, maybe uh, on top of the next boss later on. Either way, 40k definitely really far ahead. They have the four deaths, uh, but uh, it's not going to matter. <laughs> you know, Method has 11 deaths, so 35 seconds difference there, and they are very close to finishing of Realm. Uh, there's not that much more trash they have to do to be able to get enough trash uh, in the basement. So all they, what they probably are going to do is just pull those survivalists uh, in this like living room lodge area and just snapshot it on top of the tank here after this Realm pull. Yep, Rel is going down for 40k, so they're pretty significantly ahead right now. 10% extra trash on the board as well as the boss going down. They're probably setting up for a snap pull here. You see Rintari jumping on top of that sideways table as well, and Wolfbiss goes off in the Hunter's Lodge. He, he did, of course, precast tricks of the train on the tank, so when he, when he hits any of these mobs, they're going to snap to Rintari, stack everything up nice and clean for them. And on top of that, because everything's stacked up, those explosives can only spawn in one spot as well, so it's nice and easy AoE cleave for everyone else. Now, of course, once Rintari jumps down, they'll end up unsnapping, going down to the tank. So you can see just perfect execution here. Once once that marksman gets down, everything will be in perfectly fine area where nothing will be evading. They just have to make sure they deal with the explosives, and this is pretty clean execution from 40k. I mean, snap pulls, they can go wrong. I mean, it's not necessarily, it's not supposed to be a mechanic in the game that works perfectly like this every time. It's something that works maybe 90 to 95 percent of the time, and those five percent of the times are just kind of at a loss for words for what went wrong. <laughs> but seeing it pulled off perfectly with that, just good to see. 
Yeah, and also, I mean, one thing that makes the snapping pool a little bit dangerous is because all of those hunters from this room, they, they spawn those traps in the floor. You have the frost traps and you have the fire traps. And they, it's a huge area of denial, especially if everything is completely stacked on one point. If there's a bunch of traps spawning around it, it's hard for them to, to reach. But you saw uh, Kurisu just popping his AMS and just absorbing all of those tra uh, traps, the frost traps, without getting stunned. If you don't have an, a, a magic immunity, then you do get stunned and you definitely don't want that, want that to happen. Now, unfortunately, they have LaSalle and Rentari go down uh, on one of their skips here. This is actually something we've seen happen multiple times that uh, teams have deaths here on this very skip. There's something that is difficult for them to drop combat with. Uh, maybe some sort of true side mob uh, or an emissary that is causing problems for them. But as long as the healer does get the Shadow Melt off, then he didn't, can have the Masters come through. Now, they are on six deaths, so the, the advantage they have from the death uh, is a little bit lower now, but Method, you still just work on those Revelist packs that we just saw for the K kill. Yeah, also of note, both teams have their Bloodless available, and I was going to say, if 40, it's going to be interesting to see how 40k plays this dungeon. A lot of teams will end up saving that Bloodless to pull the, all, all seven of the Gloom Horrors on top of Gorak Tool at the end of the dungeon, since that's a little bit more dangerous than this pull. But they're just going to go ahead and go right into it, pulling trash with Lord and Lady Waycrest. Of course, you're going to be keeping an eye on the Holy DK damage, popping off for about 500k DPS, which is kind of the most you can assume from, from them, on, them on this pull. This isn't necessarily the biggest trash pull in the world, you're just kind of doing it for safety. A lot of this trash in here can do a lot of residual group damage, especially if any of those Soul Fetish caskets off. If any of those get off, this pull becomes infinitely more difficult. So you kind of just want to burst through the trash as quickly as possible, and that's that's why you see them end up using the Bloodlust here. Of course, this pull is doable without the Bloodlust, but really it's only a safety measure, and I wouldn't surprise me to see them just pull the Gloom Horrors on their own after this because they are so far ahead in the dungeon after the wipes from Method EU. And speaking of wipes, now has gone down for Method EU, and he's their battle race. They don't have any way of getting them back up, so the only... The only way they can fix this pull is if they finish everything off before before the trash just kills them. Now the trash is incredibly low, most of the trash is sitting around that 20 to 30 percent mark. But there's just so much residual group damage going off, and on top of that, once they finish off a mob, mob they get a stack of bursting and take so much damage from the group. The only thing I think they have a chance of doing is if Frag is able to leech himself with that soul running talent, but he goes down. I'm not really sure how they're going to live through this pull. Yeah, we saw Jinji immediately popping that repulse and actually off tanking the mobs for so long. Jinji was just tanking them, and, and Frag on the Demon Hunter as well, as you mentioned, with that leech, just being able to off tank it so much. And we saw the turtle come out of Maris. And, you know, they try, they actually survived for a really long time with now being dead. But now Frack going down, Ginger being down, it's only Sally and Maris left. They might be able to kite it out, but this is costing them a long time. And this is the problem with having your rest on the tank, right? Because the tanks are the, the ones that uh, are living a very dangerous life. And if they go down and not being able to get them back up, is just a huge problem. We've seen Legion as well when uh, people were playing uh, with only the battle rest on the tank with that Blood DK being very famous uh, last year around. So they did manage to finish it off. So really good on them to be able to just... Um, Save this pull, but it's still again just costing them so much time because now they have to rest everyone up, and it, you know it took them forever to finish this pack off. Yeah, credit where credit's due. I didn't think they had any chance of finishing that off, but Genji was able to stealth back to the group because, of course, once you kill Roll, all the doors open, so it's not that far of a run for him. I think what they're planning on doing is getting a mass AOE res off. They should actually be able to res now and frag through the floor here since it is a hundred yard uh, AOE radius, including verticality. So they should be able to get them off here. It might actually be pretty close because this is a pretty massive dungeon, but I think they're going to be able to get the res off. And he looks like Frag was up to now get it. Now Zaley is going to have to run up a little bit closer just to get now. So just more time on the board. And honestly, that wipe probably ended up costing them close to a minute with all these reses that they have to get off. They had to fit, slowly finish off the trash. And, you know, it wasn't as bad as a team wipe. Obviously, give them credit or credits to do the fact that they were able to finish that off without a tank and one of their DPS up. Actually, two DPS up for the entire, was, entire time was pretty impressive. But 40k, they've already finished off Lord and Lady Waycrest, and they're finishing on, off their last trash percentage right now. And it looks like we were right, but with the Gloom Horrors, they just decided to deal with them on their own instead of trying to pull them with Barak tool later on. Yeah, so this is actually a pretty uh, big problem. Uh, so they miscalculated the trash on 40k side. They had 99% after the Gloom Horrors. There's no way they planned on soloing a Void Touched Emissary to get the last percentage. This is no way that this is planned. They just uh, miscalculated, forgot to pull something. M maybe not miscalculated, but just, you know, didn't pull something that they were supposed to pull. So with them having to single target this Void Touched Emissary down, it's actually kind of, uh, uh, it's a big time sink. And if this would have been closer, then it could have meant quite a bit. They maybe even could have lost the game because of this uh, missing trash that they had. But obviously they're so far ahead that it won't matter in the end. But if you look at those close games between Pain for a Fam and No Girls Allowed in this Atala, sorry, for example, if you have mistakes like that, then it will cost you at the end. So uh, 40k, definitely the better team in this dungeon method of you just having so many problems. Uh, also running this 
interesting comp, let's call it that. But uh, yeah, 40k, if they if they want to uh, get their spot, they probably need to play better, especially since we saw No Girls Allowed do so well earlier, considering, you know, all the dungeons that were not told by Gore. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not quite sure how, what to think of that now tweet right now. Because I mean, if you're if you're seriously trying to back that up with the way this dungeon went, uh, this this can't happen. This isn't this isn't the method you were used to seeing. Obviously, we're not used to seeing any team that looks like this this comp right now. But like, this is just completely out of the ordinary for for a team that hates losing as much as these guys all individually do. Like, it's 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 interesting to see, and, I, and like I want to thank them for showing off what classes other than our normal comps can do as well. But it's just. You know, I, I'd like to see more from them just because we're so used to seeing them overperform in general. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they, they definitely deserve to have a little bit of fun and maybe not put as much practice in as they used to in the past because they really did deserve, the, or they do deserve, the number one seed in the Western region, of course. I mean, uh, they, they've won so many of the Cups. They did so well throughout all of the season. So them being able to relax a little bit in this last cap and just have a little bit of fun, try it out new comps and see how those new classes can do, definitely something they do deserve. But as you mentioned, right, with them hate, hating to lose, uh, there, there might still be something left in them and they might, like, uh, get it back into the, uh, in the next two dungeons. Hey! <laughs> That's a very weird blue color. I don't know what this is about. Either way, it is the Rasta Shaman. A blue and healing <laughs> A blue Rasta Druid coming out of Sally here. And we see Marius actually being on the Brewmaster tank. So now is the one who is switching to the DPS role, playing that Fury Warrior. So completely switching up everything. Not a single rogue in their comp. So no more uh, 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 mythic rogue invitational basically <laughs> so we'll see how they do without the rogue now one big problem with this comp is going to be the fact that Celia and the shaman cannot be a night elf at all so there's no shadow melt available unfortunately for the healer uh, which might be causing some trouble we will see what exactly they do to overcome this fact that they can't use the shadow melt on the healer now 40k on the other hand they're obviously running a more you know viable comp for the MDI as they're running the unholy DK and they run wind and broke. Yeah, Zaley is doing it, by the way. I checked his uh, checked his Azerite traits here. He's running triple igneous potential, which makes his lava burst do a lot more damage. And for those of you out there who don't know how lava burst works, it crits 100% of the time. So every single time he casts that lava burst, it's going to hit for anywhere in the range of like 55 to 60k, depending on int procs. And uh, yeah, uh, Resto Shamans can do a solid 25 to 30k single target DPS, which is ridiculous. Unfortunately, he doesn't end up going down there. Did he? Did he onk? I think he onked, yeah. Did he onk right away? What? Okay, well, fantastic use of the onk. Won't, ha won't have that one for another 30 minutes. But, uh, you know, there's a chance it comes back up in the dungeon if this goes as poorly as the way Crest Banner did for both teams. So we'll keep an eye on that one here. Bloodlust instantly popped on Aquasir with a pretty significant amount of trash. And Windspeaker held his... I'm just interested to see what this what this Resto Shaman can do on single target. I really like the confidence, you know? It's just like... Uh, I'm just gonna Ankh here, even though Maris could have casted an out of combat rest, you know? Just like, you know what? I don't need Ankh. I'm just gonna use it right away, saving like one or two seconds. So well done, Madame As they pull, uh, both of them actually pulling Heldis on top of Aquasia, both of them using the Bloodlust. Now, 40k did a little bit of a bigger pull at the start of the dungeon, so they had 2% more trash at the start. Uh, you can still see the difference a little bit there, and we will see what kind of uh, damage both of those teams can do. You see that DK doing such an insane amount of burst damage, so that's Definitely uh, the, the trash dying a lot faster for 40k here at the start just because of the, the strength of the DK. Uh, and Sally not really not doing that much damage yet, but uh, 35k, I mean, that's quite a lot for, for a healer in general. Well, it's important to mention that's all single target damage. Yeah. He, that's, yeah. All, that's all to Aqua Series, not AoEing whatsoever because he just doesn't have an AoE ability at all to cast. All he's got is, I believe, Lightning Bolt, Lava Burst, and Flame Shock. That's it. They might have Chain Lightning as well, but that can only hit three targets for us of Shamans, I believe. So there's not a whole lot they can do for full on AoE. They don't have Earthquake, that's Elemental Shaman only so literally everything he does is single target and he's doing 30k on single target so there's a lot to be said for resto shaman single target damage now the other interesting thing of course about method to use comp is that miras and now have roll swapped miras is tanking on the brewmaster and now is uh, dpsing on the warrior this isn't too out of the ordinary for Miraz. I believe he tanked Mythic Unat for Method yeah. on, on the Brewmaster as well, so he's definitely versed in the Brewmaster. He knows how to play it properly. Uh, now, I don't know if I've ever seen him now play play Warrior DPS, though. Maybe I you know more about sometime, that. Uh, he definitely does uh, sometimes meme on his stream and starts playing Fury Warrior and lets other people tank. You see, 
he basically just got really bored of the tanking role and when he was uh, forced to play Proud Warrior, he just started disliking the tank role because he said basically that it's boring and he doesn't want to play it anymore. So lots of times on stream he will switch to the DPS role and play Fury Warrior, play some other class like Demon Hunter. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm not surprised that he wants to have a little bit of fun here and just switch to the damage role. But uh, 40k and uh, Method U, they, they're very close here uh, in this on this boss at least. 40k is still ahead in trash by 4%, but on the boss itself, uh, Method U actually catching up as they're already working on the last two Aqualings, well, 40k still has all three of them alive. So uh, 40k slightly behind on the boss, but they have the four extra percentage. Now we see Zalia uh, 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 pulling some of those droplets just to get a little bit extra percentage on top. Yeah, that was, uh, I mean, that's pretty awesome to see. And I, I want to point out, we got a call from uh, from the back telling us that, that was actually the Octotem, not the Onk coming oh, out from okay. Zalia. So that was a planned skip. They definitely... <laughs> Surprisingly, they have some practice. That or Zalia is uh, a complete freak and he knows how to play his class better than anyone else. And he's like, no, guys, I got this Ankh Totem myself. Get out. And he's just <laughs> perfectly did the skip. So he still has the regular Ankh available. Of course, Ankh Totem is only a five minute cooldown, whereas Ankh is a 30 minute cooldown. So the presence of mind to be able to pop that during a skip whenever you know you're going to be going down and everyone else can shadow melt th uh, things off. I mean, that's just insane play from him. Uh, one thing to note is also that Sally used to main Raster Shaman for a very, very long time uh, before um, uh, before when he was playing in Method on in PvE. He got lots of will first on that Raster Shaman. So he was maining that class for a long time up until the point uh, when he came back in BFA, started playing again, and Shaman was not maybe not doing as well as a Discrease. So he did, switch role, he did switch class and started playing Discrease instead of Shaman. But he definitely knows how to play Shaman in general. He has lots of experience on that class. So if anyone can pull up a shaman and it should be Celia in theory uh, but 40k they're already working on this trash pull here doing a pretty significant pull uh, I'm not completely sure if they pulled the mini boss on top of this as well but uh, they, they're just gathering up this whole area here yeah, something else interesting as well as uh, about Zelia's as right. This may be, might not be as interesting as the other things. Running double pack spirit, which means if he's ever like completely oom and absolutely needs to heal himself, he can just pop into Ghost Wolf as well. I don't see a situation where that's going to be useful outside of being completely oom, but it's just interesting to look at the as right for a class that we literally never see in the MDI, just trying to see what he's running. Of course, he does have the triple igneous potential once again for full single target damage, so I'm interested to see, especially on the targets where he has multiple flame shocks out, which are, there are plenty of those bosses in the dungeon that have multiple flame shock targets. He's going to be able to do a lot of boss damage in here, but still. Method EU is actually not ahead. We've been talking about them a little too much just because the exciting comp. 40k is trucking ahead in the dungeon. They're not having a bad pull at all. They're about to finish the pull that Method EU just started. They're about 10, 8%, 10% ahead in trash in general right now once Runecarver Storm goes down. And they're just kind of trucking ahead right now. They're, I, I think the only chance Method EU has at this point, unless, unless you know, assuming neither team makes too many massive mistakes, no, no full wipe for either team, Method EU has one advantage in that I think with the Battle Shaman and the potential for more single target damage, they have an outside chance of maybe one phasing the final boss. Uh, th there's a very high chance to if you think about it, because not only um not only do they have the physical damage increase by, from Maris by the Monk, but they also have the magic damage increase from, uh, from Frag Decay, uh, from Frag's Demon Hunter, right? And then he, the, the Shaman does even more damage because of the 5% magic damage that he gain extra. So uh, all buffs are basically there. You also have the better Bloodlust because um, Shamans have the real Bloodlust while 40k has to use the drums, so slightly worse there as well. So damage overall, they should be beating 40k for sure on the last boss, especially with that buff. So there's definitely the potential for them to one phase. Now, one thing to note is that we haven't really talked about the, the affixes yet. We have Tyrannical, of course, and then we also have Skittish, which shouldn't be a big deal except on the last boss, maybe, with the healer buff. But we have Raging. Now, Raging... Uh, we don't really talk about it too often just because the Raster Druids are able to soothe off the Raging effect once the, the mobs drop below 30% on the high priority targets. But uh, because Method EU actually has the Hunter, they can dispel it as well. They can remove Raging just as well as a Raster Druid can. So making up for the fact that they don't have the Raster Druid. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, oh, they don't have a Soothe, but no, they actually have Genji for that as well, so it's, it's good to see that as well. And we talked about this yesterday, actually, in China of the Storm, with how difficult Raging is. Remember, we were watching No Girls Alette, I believe, me and Salute were casting that one, and yeah, it, we saw Trell go down like three times on the first pull. It was two or three times on the first pull, just because the mobs were getting the Raging cast off, and he was instantly just going 100 to zero after two casts hit him. It was a lot of damage. There's a lot going on here. But yeah, keep, keep one second, hold that thought. 40k doing a very large trash pull. All of the initiates on top 
of Brother on Hole and Gale Caller Faye, and just a lot of damage coming out on the pole there. It, 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 looked like, it looked like it was a little bigger than it was, but it was only the initiates. But still, just a lot of cleave damage on top of the bosses, and I'm interested to see if they're going to end up using that rock spot. It looks like uh, Igloo is going up, and the rest of the group is going to be moving up there as well. And we haven't really seen this from any of the other NA teams this weekend. Nobody's actually been playing the strategy. I believe we only saw the No Girls Allowed match where the, they didn't opt to go for the strategy at all. So it's interesting to see these teams actually go for the strategy. This allows them to completely dodge any of the tornadoes during this boss. Yeah, so we've been focused a lot on this very interesting combat method you but 40k having such a clean run up until this point. They have zero deaths. They did some very huge pulls up until there, right? They pulled all of the uh, apprentice area, so this, this room before the stairs, uh, all at once. I, I believe they were uh, cutting it into the cor corner. They were kind of snapping it there, uh, which is something we've seen from Buffalo in Europe, from the eastern region as well. And now they're jumping up to this latch and just pulling the initiates with the boss. So just very well done by them so far. Uh, completely clean run so they definitely show 40k is really showing that they really want to go to BlizzCon they want this spot and even if they didn't really show up the first cup and the second cup the way we wanted them to show up maybe they really just needed some time to have uh, their new comp uh, their new lineup with Kurisu coming in instead of Lofus they just needed to, to build that synergy in the first two cups and needed to uh, you know just play together a bunch to be able to get back to their performance that they had in the spring season and now they really Really are showing up so uh, we'll see how they continue in this dungeon right now they're pretty far ahead compared to method you they're both on 64 uh, percent but method you just basically now starting to boss well 40k is already very low what was that green ring thing we just saw on the ground? Was that a spirit link totem from Zelia <laughs> in a Mythic Plus MDI dungeon? We've, I think it's the first time we've seen one of those since, uh, geez, was it the Eastern region last year? I don't remember yeah. which cup it was. That was a long time ago. I think that was APAC that we saw that in. That was a long time ago. Man, Zelia really pulling out all the moves here. Of course, they had like a four stack of the Slicing Winds. They're back up to a four stack here. They're just letting Cast go through. Now, of course, the reason they're doing that is every single time you interrupt that boss, Gale Collar Fate, she'll spawn one of the tornadoes, and you'll notice that their room is completely clear of any tornadoes whatsoever because they keep letting the Slicing Blast go through. Like, they're just not interrupting a single one. This is a really interesting strategy, and maybe this is just because they're comfortable doing it with the Resto Shaman. This is actually just an interesting strat. It really could be because, uh, I mean, the Resto Shaman's strength is uh, AoE healing when everyone is stacked up and you can just put down your healing rain and use those chain heals to and use your aoe cooldowns as well like the like the um, um the aoe totem healing totem that i literally just forgot the name of and you have this slt as you mentioned before so just having those big cooldowns and having those big aoe heals really helping out by letting those casts go through but sally struggling a little bit with mana now uh but as soon as Gale Color Fate is down, there's basically no more AoE damage, just a little bit tank damage from Brother Iron Hall, so it shouldn't be a problem even if Sally is completely out of mana. Either way, 40k already down the boss, now they're doing a skip, so they're not dealing with any of those enforcers that are so difficult for teams to deal with. They just completely skip past, and they're just going to deal with some brat, uh, some rich trash instead. Yeah, but Method EU is on a similar trash percentage, but the thing is, they're, they're doing their boss completely differently. 40k opted to completely cleave both of their bosses down at the same time, whereas Method who has single targeted Gale Collar Fate, and usually when we see teams do this, that's because they want to cleave trash on top of Brother Iron Hall. So I'm gonna keep an eye on Method you see if they end up pulling trash, and they got a pack of initiates, but that's usually not quite what we're looking for. We're looking for a couple of those other mobs that Gale Collar Apprentices, the, 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 the bigger mobs that they'll cleave on top of Iron Hall. So they'll probably end up doing that. But because of their mob count, 40k is gonna have to pull the entire bridge here, and it looks like they're doing it pretty perfectly. Look at the Unholy DK popping off for 40k. Big, big problem with this, everything is in that raging act at the same time, so they gotta kill this quickly. They don't have enough soothes to deal with everything at the same time but that i mean that was almost perfect from 40k big pull for them and able being able to pull that off perfectly with no deaths they've got both of their battle roses on the board they're looking pretty in this dungeon right now yeah they're looking so good i mean if you look at the final time they're only in the dungeon for 12 minutes at this point and uh, they uh, after this after this pull here, they only have to do the Dwellers, and then they get the rest of the percentage in the last boss room, which they can pull on top of the boss and just make use of that buff that is going to be on the rest of the Druid, increasing the damage done. So, insane speed by 40k, clean run, zero death so far. They have their Blood Us ready, which I assume they are going to save for the last boss. Uh, they actually could one-face the last boss as well. We have talked about Method U being able to one-face it with their interesting comp, but it's very likely that 40k might just be able to one face at two because they have the DK, so they have this huge single target burst with the bloodlust, with the uh, with the army and the eels just buffing uh, the strength of the of the DK. So there's definitely a high possibility that 40k can just one face uh, the last boss as well.
We saw the Onk Totem skip there again from Zelia. Of course, the biggest problem with Resto Shaman is apparently they can't be Night Elves. Oh, that's right. They can't be Night Elves. We know that. Yeah. We know that from the spring season where we had Team Poluka running the Elemental Shaman. They can't run Night Elves, so they don't have Shadow Melt. Of course, the thing that a Resto Shaman has over an Ellie Shaman is you have access to Onk Totem. So you can just Onk Totem yourself for skips instead of, instead of having to wait for a res or use your own use your own Ock. So a little bit of an advantage. The biggest problem, of course, is that you still have those five seconds on the board. And another big problem is that since you are since you spawn with below 10% mana, if you use any mana, you'll instantly proc your staff. And that's something we haven't gone over in this dungeon at all. Both of the healers have proc their staff at some point earlier on the dungeon, which means they won't have that big saved up uh, Ashara staff proc for the eels whenever they get to the final boss. They won't be able to one-shot the eels like we saw from Edelweiss yesterday. So they're going to have to actually AoE those down. Now, that might be on purpose because they want to actually give that damage to the Unholy DK so they can do more boss damage. But we'll have to keep an eye on that. We'll have to be able to see if that's going to change how they do their strategies later on in the dungeon. This has been a dangerous pull for Method EU, but you did see that Spirit Link totem come out and pretty much save everyone's life. Yeah, so the only so both of those teams actually have insanely clean runs so far. Now, of course, Method U is slower, but the two deaths that Method U had are both from Saelia using that Ang Totem because of not having the Shadow Mel. So uh, that those two deaths were on purpose. There was no other way for them to get Saelia passed. So both of them perfectly clean runs so far. Really well done. Unfortunately, uh, as I say that, Resto Igloo is going down. They do have a DK, thankfully. So there's a way to get them back up. Unfortunately, Igloo was mind controlled. He jumped into that well in the back to be able to go below 50% to break the mind control, uh, but he didn't jump out early enough and just died to the damage. But thankfully, as I mentioned before, having that DK there, the safety net to just get the healer back up. Yeah, I mean, we talk about how teams is, oh, they'll just hop in the pool and deal damage to each other, and, you know, they'll just take damage from the pool. Well, the thing is, that pool does a lot of damage, and it does... Pr it does, it does Whenever you're mind controlled, you have a lot more HP than you normally do. So if you don't hop out of that pool early, you can just go down, which is what we saw from Igloo there, unfortunately. But yeah, it's just a little bit unfortunate timing. You kind of want to hop out right before you hit the 50% mark so you can let your team cleave down the last 2 or 3% just nice and easily. So to see that death is a little unfortunate. But while we're talking about that, another hiccup on the side of Method EU is Frag goes down to these Abyssal. It's not quite perfect play from Method EU either. Yeah, it's really just because it's that they had a perfect run up until then. That's why both of the teams decided to have one death come in for both sides. Very unfortunately, uh, so they need to out of combat rest, frag out. It's uh, actually Maris that is resting just so Salia can uh, get some preparations, get the mana back, uh, just to, you know, not waste any sort of time. 40k on the other hand, they're about to finish up Lord Storm Song. So once they finish up Lord Storm Song, it's only going to be the last boss between them and the whole trash uh, area from the last boss, which is a couple of eel packs and this middle trash pack that you usually, you pull two, um, you two, uh, put, sorry, you pull two eel packs on top of the boss at the very start that you just cleave down randomly and then you pull another two eel packs on top of the boss with the bloodlust after the first intermission phase and that's when you use your bloodlust, you use your army of the death on your DK and you use the Rasta Druid with the damage buff and try to one face it, which again is very highly possible that 40k can do. And it's important to mention that with the Unholy DK in your comp, that, a that random AoE damage actually translates into more boss damage through both the exponential AoE and the Fester Mitrate that they have that gives them extra strength whenever they, I believe, whenever they pop their boils. So it's a lot of extra single target damage for the Unholy DK when you do that AoE, which is why we're c considering them having the possibility of one phase. Actually, I think both teams have the possibility of one phase if they play their cards perfectly, which is why we see both of them holding on to that second Bloodlust. They're saving it purely for the chance of getting that boss as low as possible, even p possibly one phasing it. And I mean, you can you can kind of see on this single target Lord Storm Song encounter, you can kind of see what Resto Shaman is capable of when they don't have to do any healing. He's doing 25k right now, and I think this is probably on the low end of what Resto Shaman is capable of. Just not getting a Lava Surge procs, maybe not getting good Trinket procs, but they can definitely do a lot of single target damage. And now we'll see what 40k does here as they are in the last boss area. Now, there's still lots of things that can go wrong uh, on this fight, especially if you really try to force the one phase. So basically just getting one intermission phase. We've seen lots of teams try it and then it, the boss reset somehow or they had the healer die because you're trying to min-max your DPS, right? Because you need so much damage to be able to get the boss low enough to not get the second intermission phase. And while you try to min-max this much and play really risky to get out as much damage as possible, there's people who just went down left and right, either getting hit by Tentacle or getting hit by the Swirly, as you can see it spawned right now, just because you want to uh, min-max your damage so much. Uh, you saw the first two eel packs already going down here, so we're going to get the very first intermission phase soon. And they got the boss at 72%, so that's very low. When we saw Abracadabra have their chance at kind of one-phasing this boss, we didn't actually see them finish it off. We keep talking about it. They were absolutely destroying the boss. 
this is what they got into. They got up to 72%. And they were absolutely destroying that boss with the Unholy Decay cooldown. You see, as the army of the dead available, he'll probably have all of his cooldowns available as well, because they're gonna have to deal with both this animation phase. And on top of that, they'll probably deal with the with those three denizens we can see on our screen as well afterwards, just to make sure that they have all of their cooldowns up for that burn. But man, I'm I'm actually I'm so hyped to see this. I want to see if they get that one phase off, because that would be the first time we see it on the 18 in tournament play this entire cup. Yeah, there's definitely a very high possibility. Now the only thing uh they need to be paying attention to is keeping uh, Igloo alive on the Drastor Druid. If he goes down, there's a rest that they have to get him back up, but he will lose the buff. He will lose the nine stacks of the buff that you can see right now in the group frames. It does increase his damage. Uh, so if he loses the buff, there's no way they can do the one phase anymore because it's so close in DPS. We haven't seen any other team one phase it yet uh, on the 18, as Syro just mentioned. So anything going wrong here, anyone going down, losing the buff will all mean that they won't be able to do it anymore. So we'll see what they do once they finish off those denizens. They will probably do pull the, those eel packs on top, as we mentioned, just because it will increase Kurisu's damage. But the problem while having those eel packs is that it is a skittish dungeon. And uh, if Igloo gets any sort of debuffs from those eels, he will go down because of his max HP being reduced. Here it goes, Army of the Dead being channeled. Boss, I mean, I do hear it comes in. Holy DK damage is going to be coming out. It's going to be popping those boils, getting those Festermite stacks, and we're just going to see, can they do it? Keep an eye on that purple bar below the boss's HP mark. Whenever that hits 100% energy, he will start casting Grasp of the Sunken City. When that cast finishes, they'll go back into the intermission phase. But, I mean, they're, they're doing a pretty good amount of burst da damage here, but so far, it just looks like it's not quite going to be enough. I think not having that staff proc is just not that big, but this, this boss is still going on quickly. It's going to be probably the lowest pull we've ever seen if they don't one phase this. I think, okay, so what happened there was once they pulled the eels, Eagle was not going into melee range because he had to be careful, right? So he was just standing there, tranking, uh, using some solar rafts, and then once the eels were down, Igloo was able to go back into melee range, but he was losing quite a bit of damage because he couldn't go there because he was he was too afraid of dying. But you can see the energy bar going higher and higher. They won't be able to do it, actually. They cast a grasp right now, so uh, just m maybe not being able to get enough damage from the rest to do it out there because of those eels not dying fast enough. Either way, don't, they have to play another intermission phase. Well, Method you are finally now as well on Volsif, and uh, they're still dealing with the very first intermission phase, though. I, I want to say that was the, probably the best attempt we've seen yeah. throughout all of our attempts in the 18. I don't, think, I don't think most teams are even going for it. I think with good RNG, maybe a Rogue 5 buff, maybe some extra damage from the healer, there's a chance of that. I mean, we've seen some healers do as much as, like, 70, 80k single target, even without the staff proc on, on, on this boss. So just kind of not the greatest RNG for Migli. He, was, he wasn't able to pump out the most damage. I would love to see this, you know, one phase at some point in the tournament. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see it from Method EU either because their boss is at 80%. I mean, 40 case was at 72% and they had a pretty solid pull as well. So I don't think there's any way you're one phasing it from 80%. Just, I don't know, a little unfortunate to see. But that being said, with the way 40k is playing right now, they're going to end up taking this dungeon with massively clean play. Only one death on the board. All they have to do is finish off this intermission and then it's the layup here. All they have to do is finish the boss at 11%. And there's not really a whole lot that can go wrong once you're out of the intermission phase. 40k is going to end up taking the series 2-0. And this is the first time I think this entire year that Method EU has ever been knocked out of a tournament before the Grand Finals. This is absolutely insane. Of course, they're actually going down here, unfortunately, but they're still going to be able to finish it off. Uh, can't see the attempt for Method EU to finish off the scene, but yeah, 40k. What a performance here against Method EU, just finishing 2-0. Face each other in the upper final in any of the two seasons at all this year. So uh, right off the bat, aggressive pull here for Abra, grabbing everything together at the top on top of the Matron with a Bloodlust on top of it. Method uh, taking it a bit slower and going down to the Mask with a Mask Stealth and then doing their big pull there, but no Bloodlust from them, Nagur. Yeah, so they actually pulled the, the Patrol and uh, on top of the Mask here, which is pretty dangerous because you have multiple Blood Priests here and the Matron on top of the Mask and you have to interrupt all of those casts from the Double Blood Priest, constantly casting those healing abilities and the huge AoEs coming out of the mask, plus the Matron just buffing all of the mobs around them with a haste buff, with this war cry that you see just now going off. So well done by Method uh, NA to be able to do this without the Bloodlust usage. Well, Abracadabra is still working on their pool. Uh, not completely sure if they mismanaged their Desanguing a little bit there. Either way, they, it took them a little bit longer than Method NA, but they also got the 17% compared to the 11. Uh, there was a bit of mismanagement, so one of the Blood Priests actually ended up bathing in some of that Panini Cristini on the ground, and <laughs> 
and just healing for like 40 percent hp so they had to grip that out so one of the advantages of the double uh, unholy dk here is not just of course the immense damage but because we're in this sanguine nature you have an extra grip on your hands that you can help with uh situations like i just mentioned where you know a mob is accidentally left behind not bumped properly bathing in sanguine whatever it may be nonetheless both teams here on Elderly Axa right now is Method and A Hazard down to 60% and Abraki Dabra. I was about to say Method U because I'm so used to Method U being here, but Abraki Dabra 72% on Elderly Axa right now. Um, you know, I don't think we've actually seen Underwrought at all yet uh, this entire weekend. So this is the first time we're seeing it. Now, it was a time trial dungeon, but these are some actually pretty nasty affixes, especially once we get to Kragma's room. Yeah, most definitely. You have Necrotic uh, being super annoying for the tank as you see Divine Field actually dropping very low as one of the cast is going through from the boss here. Did manage to recover though, but had to use a lot of cooldowns to keep him alive. But yeah, the, the affixes in general, not only Necrotic is going to be a huge problem for the tank, and that's why both of them are playing Dwarf to have the stone form um, available to get rid of those stacks. But you also have Sanguine. So uh, lots of the mobs that are in Krogma's room have different kinds of HP. You have the Living Rods having more HP than anything else. And then you have um, Lashers and Maggots. All of them have different kinds of HP. So the Sanguine management will matter a lot, especially since you only have the Ring of Peace and some single target uh, grips coming in by the DKs. You don't have anything like a Typhoon, for example, from a Rastadrood anymore. And yeah, you're absolutely right. But they, the second DK kind of helps just a bit. Um, it really, yeah, exactly. So I was just about to say, really what it's going to come down to is killing the ads before that tool. Sanguine triggers. I wow. mean, this is an almost full room pull for Method and A here with the double unholy DK trying to do some work. Shakiboardy rocketing ahead. Lighty starting to catch up. And most of the trash starting to melt. Now they have to be really careful here with the Sanguine, but everything <laughs> is dead at the same time. And that's exactly what I wanted to mention is Sanguine has that one second arming time. When it goes down, it doesn't immediately heal what's in it. So as long as you just kill everything within that second, not forehead this time, then you're good. And that's exactly what Method and A did. They pulled everything and the Unholy DK just does so much damage that it just annihilated the entire room. Who cares about Necrotic? Who cares about saying Who cares about anything? Who cares about any mechanic? <laughs> life? Or any affix, right? <laughs> Who cares about life even when Unholy DKs just kill things before you even have to worry about it? Yeah, that was just an insane pull coming out of Method and A here. They really just pulled, they got so much percentages just from just one pull that they did and the, the trash is that in seconds even it was just the insane damage coming out of Shakib and Lady on that DK uh, those pulls are usually very difficult just because the trash here is very dangerous there's lots of cast that need to un interrupt and on top of that there's emissaries of tight in these pulls that means that none of these maps are standable interruptible nothing like that and you have the maggots casting frontals you have the lashers casting uh, the stun that needs the absorb that can't be interrupted so that's why also yoda is running human actually so he's running that human racial to be able to get rid of the stun in case a lasher cast goes through on him and you also have them running the mistweaver monk who can dispel the disease, which is the stand from the Lashers. Yeah, it, it's funny. Usually this room takes a while and we talk about it just like you did. And we go, oh, no, you know, oh, the, the Lasher got it interrupted and we have the uh, Swarmer going out and oh, no, that person got low. And Method and is already on the boss. <laughs> Everything's already dead. There's nothing to even talk about for them uh, about Kragmon's room being dangerous because they just deleted it from this instance. Kragmon now down to 68% for Method and A that sits at 59% trash. Usually we see teams in the, uh, the high 50s low 60s worth of percentage trash. Abracadabra doing just way more modest pulls here. They did pull the Guardians on top of the remaining trash here in Kragma's room, but I mean, this is just basically a third of the pull that Methe and, and, and they uh, did earlier. Unho two unholy DKs on either side too, so you can you really tell that Method and they had this room much better practiced. Yeah, I mean, they also didn't have the Bloodlust available for Abra because they did the bigger pull at the very start of the in instance. So with Abra also pulling the Skeletons here, they're going to be qu uh, quite far ahead in Trash, actually. If you look at the percentages, 59 for Method and A, and once Abra is done with this pull, they're actually on 71%. So it is a, a pretty, it's a 12% difference between the two, so if there's some time they can make up later uh, for Abra, because they don't have to pull as much stress as Method and A does. So uh, there's some advantages that they have, but Kragma already being on 23% here for Method and A and Abra just now pulling it.
Yeah, so, I, I mean, that that's going to add up. But the thing is, you know, trash to a certain extent is... I mean, it's obviously important. You need to finish the dungeon. We're in Fortified. But when you have so, so much power with two Unholy DKs, you know, we talk about, oh, no, yeah, how much? 12% uh, between the two teams. It's really not a big deal. Because with two Unholy DKs, you go, oh, yeah, just pull an extra 12% on top of already pulling. It doesn't matter if we cleave 15 targets or 25 targets. As long <laughs> as we survive, it'll all die very quickly. So, speaking of uh, Death Kragma here, now down to 5%. So, Method and A going to be finishing that up. And we'll see exactly what they do with the trash leading up to Spore Collar Zancha. Now, as far as the trash is concerned there, you do need some babysitting because there are some emissaries of Tides present. And of course, we have the Defilers present as well, which have several dangerous casts, the Shadow Bolt Volley, the Withering Curse. So you need to be able to interrupt those. You need to be able to separate the Enchanted Emissary from them. And there's really just not as much prowess as you can take advantage of with the Double Unholy DK as there is in Kragma's room, which they've already done. Kragma now down to 38% for Abracadabra. That sits at 71% trash. Method has, of course, dealt with Kragma and done a pull here with 59% trash. Yeah. They there's another thing to know with the Emissary of Tides is that uh, neither team has a Raster Druid. A Raster Druid is usually very nice to deal with the Tides because they can just constantly spam entangling roots on them, which only lasts for 8 seconds, but since there's no DR on them, they can just constantly recast the root. Now, Ring of Peace makes it so you can actually disconnect the Emissary of Tides from the Defilers or from another trash pack and just pull the Tides by its own, so that will definitely help them as well, but you can't pull a, a whole trash pack and just constantly see the Emissary of Tides unless you have your Rose constantly sap it, which means that the rogue can't do anything else other than sapping. So uh, we'll see what they do with the Ring of Peace here instead of the Entangling Roots. Abra just now getting closer to downing Kragma. Well, Method and A at this point, they are on 71% trash too. So they caught up on trash uh, and they're now pulling Sanchez as well with the Ring of Peace as I just mentioned. Yeah. Yep, the Ring of Peace and two Emissaries on top of Sanchez. And while those two Emissaries dies, I'm going to largely expect that the two Defilers are going to be pulled on top of the boss after and they do have still have the interrupts to uh, kind of attend to those double interrupts needed per Defiler. So as long as you just assign one melee in the tank and then the other two melee to the second, uh, Defiler should be good. You can already see one of them marked with a green triangle there for them. So expect those to be pulled as soon as these ties are done teleporting out of the dungeon. Mushrooms finally explode here for Zancha. Frontal for the Shockwave as well. Nerf does his uh, best to try and point it towards some of the Mushrooms, but he actually missed quite a few of them. Zmok, however, going down here on the side of Abrakidabra. That's their second death in the dungeon and they don't have the battle rest to give him either. So he has to release and run all the way back right now while the rest of the team tries to finish off this pack with Sanguine going down. I'm not sure if they killed the Hazard Spaghetti there and Divine Field ticking down from the uh, the Wicked Frenzy as well from one of the Guardians. I mean, this is uh, this is not the Abra that we saw yesterday so Yeah, this far. is a huge problem. With, so they, which, okay, this first pull that they were doing here, this ca cost them a lot of setup time. They were seeing uh, the Danger Noodle and they had the Emissary of Tides come in at the same time while pulling the other Guardians on top. So it took them a while to set this pull up. And as soon as they had the setup happening, Smog went down immediately. And then because of the Emissary of Tides, they were not able to interrupt the Wicked Frenzy, and therefore Divine Field had the magic debuff because of the uh, the, the Enrage Wicked Frenzy that went off on one of the Guardians. And it's a magic debuff, so there's no way for them, for Divine Field to get rid of it if with the, heal, with the healer not pressed and not being able to dispel it, and he just ticked down on top of the Necrotic. So huge problems for them. Uh, thankfully, they didn't have a full team wipe, and they still managed to get most of the trash done, uh, but they have three deaths on the board, and just, just costing them so much. Well, Method and A, uh, they're on 15% on Sancha at this point, and they also pulled the two Defilers on top, so they're in 79% trash as well. And well done with the Defilers there with a uh, final bump from the Ring of Peace just as they're about to die to make sure to get the Sanguine pool away from the boss from Spore Caller Zancha. You don't want the boss healed in that nasty Sanguine on the ground. Abracadabra has started on Zancha now and is dealing with their two em uh, t Emissary Tides uh, as well on top of the boss. Uh, now, they're at 86%. I don't know if they're going to even bother or risk pulling the two defilers that uh, Method and A had to deal with. Method and A is done with the boss and is starting to head over to that uh, more dangerous guardian pack a bit further up front. Now, you know, part of the problem, we were discussing this earlier in Agur, is it's nice when these big poles come together, they look great, they're usually uh, effective, but the problem is once you start taking too long to set them up, once there's too many moving parts, too high risk, at some point it's just more efficient to just brute force through it rather than have so many moving parts. You waste so much time, everybody get in position, get tricks of the trade up, is your CC ready, are you good to go, and you just waste valuable seconds and all that set up for nothing in the end. Yeah, it, th this is something we constantly saw when we had Infected, for example, uh, as the, the fourth affix with those Gahoonies. Uh, when, when you had the, the Infected mobs and people were running around trying to set up those huge poles while seeing the Infected mobs and getting the rest of them together, and it looks flashy and it looked really cool how they had all 
all of these setups he sees and pulling the rest together. But in the end, they were just slower than some other teams who were brute forcing it, unfortunately, because of the fact that it took so long. Now, Methane having a little bit of trouble with Sanguine here, as they've actually pulled a Corruptor on top of all of those Guardians and the Defiler as well. So pretty huge pull uh, coming in for Method and A. Uh, it only put them to 93%. Actually, 93% should be enough with the Emissary here. So they only have to kill the two Corruptors and the Emissary of Tides to get the 100%. Yeah, that should be all they need right there. And I mean, they're they're just rocketing through this dungeon right now. Yeah. Everything, it's a perfect run, zero deaths from them. Percentages should be perfect here just at the very end. Nice little ROP bump at the beginning just to uh, separate the mobs, but get them against the wall for their first Abyssal uh, Strike as well. Spore Caller Zancha still 33% for Abracadabra. Now, Abracadabra has, I suppose, the advantage of the early trash in the dungeon. They only need 6% left, and that 6% that is exactly what we're seeing Method and A do here. So all they're going to need to do is mass stealth, get on their mounts, mass stealth, and head over towards the exit. But Method and A is way too far ahead on this point. And as always, you know, we have to mention the fact that there's three deaths on the board for Abrakidaira. That's an extra 15 seconds that this team needs to overcome Method and A by. So I don't think this one's happening anything short of a wipe for Method and A, which is just not going to happen because it's fortified. This is the remainder of the trash. It's not that dangerous as long as you move out of the Abyssal Strikes on the ground. And the last boss, not a big deal. Yeah, so this is a time trial dungeon, right? And Method and A was already faster than Abra in the time trials, even though their overall seed in time trials uh, was lower for Method and A, and Abra beat them there. But obviously, they get the number one spot for Abra. But in this dungeon specifically, Method and A got the third spot, and Abra got fifth in the time trials. Even though it was only it was only 13 seconds difference between those two, but Method and A definitely seems like they even improved their strategy from the time trials. As they, I mean, if you look at the final time right now, it's 12 minutes and 20, and their time trial time was 15 minutes and 11. And they will definitely finish this dungeon faster than they did in their time trial. So definitely showing that they practiced this dungeon even more because they were not happy with their time trial time. And here they go with Bloodlust popped on the Unbound Abomination, rapidly filling up the energy bar. We always know, of course, the boss has energy filled instead of health. Spawns the blood effigies on either side. You kill six of them, you kill the boss. So here are the first two now. And they're actually almost about to fill the second bar as well. <laughs> and just these these fortified bosses at the, at the player's gear level that they have here. And of course, uh, their skill is just, it's crazy how fast they die. Unbound Abomination is basically down to 33% health at this point already. Only a couple of rotting spores have spawned and they're coming uh, towards the group. And Abracadabra is just now killing the trash and getting access to this last boss. Yeah, this is really just the... Uh, the the positivity of having the, the DKs, right, with the Bloodlust. Now, DKs, if they don't have their huge cooldowns, then they're not going to do as much of a burst DPS as they do this time around. But if you save your if you save your army with the Bloodlust for these bosses like Unbound Abomination, you see just how fast they finish off this boss. The, uh, the energy bar is almost full again, and then they're going to get the two last Blood Vestiges. Uh, they already spawned before the last ones were even dead. So just insane speed and insane amount of single target damage coming out of Method and here uh, and when they finish off the dungeon it's gonna be just short of 14 minutes so insane time as well this will be the number one time for time trials too i mean ricky dabber they almost kind of need to win this but then uh, well, of course they need to win this uh, to stay in the tournament, but after this, I'm kind of worried for them because Siege of Boralus is next, and Method and A Siege of Boralus, last time we saw it, was flawless. Yeah, and we also saw uh, Method and A already do freehold against 40k yesterday, and they had a really fast run. They had a 16-minute run, so insane time here in freehold as well, and just double DK, it's just really working out for Method and A, to be honest. I mean, whenever they are running this comp, it seems like they're just doing those crazy brute force strategies, and it's working out for them. It's really their style of playing, and, and it works well. Abra is actually only playing one DK uh, in Freehold. They switched back to the Windwalker on Swagfist here. And Divinefield going down, unfortunately, at the very end of this pull, they might still be able to kite this one out, though. Do, do you remember uh, at the end of Legion when the developers did a number squish? and everyone's damage went down, and now we have Unholy DKs doing over a million DPS again <laughs> and melting 31% of the trash before Abracadabra's even done 10% of their trash, and now they're running around frantically in circles because Divine Field died because those are unsustainable pulls for the tank long term. Nerf Tank got really low on their pull there. He finally got dispelled by JV at two stacks. He had gone through his shield wall, gone through his bolster last stand, everything. But fortunately for him, everything was dead <laughs> by the end of yep. those 10, 15 seconds. Not the case here for Abraki Dabra. Their tank's already gone down once. They're struggling to finish off the rest of this pull. Battle res is gone. Method and A, 31% trash done. Sky Captain Craig about to transition to the second phase at 75%. And I mean, this is looking great already. 
Yeah, and, and this is what we keep talking about with the scaling, right? With the extra essences, everyone just doing so much extra damage, but the HP didn't scale as well as your damage did with 8.2 and with the gear that they have in the, on this tournament realm. So uh, Method and A, they just said, you know what? Instead of dealing with the mechanics, we just get so much damage. We're just making use of the extra damage we have and just brute force everything down before any of those mechanics can even kill us. Because what Lydie calculated basically is that he said that any sort of damage uh, just kills you immediately. There's no way of you surviving anything, basically, because the HP didn't scale as well as enough as the damage. So Method and A just com completely outplaying the scaling by just killing everything before something happens to them. A good strategy, kill it before it kills you. I like yeah. it. Method and A using their bloodlust here and, of course, their armies and all their cooldowns a bit more defensively, if you will, in order to push Skypcat and Craig down from 75% as quickly to death because that second phase is really the most dangerous and where teams have the hardest time uh, just because it is an 18, it's tyrannical, even at this gear level, it does have one-shot potential if uh, the parrot kind of guano is on your face and then on top of it you get one of the frontals, it can actually easily one-shot one of the uh, DPSers and one of the melees. So they're trying to get through that phase as quickly as possible without hiccups, something that Abracadabra is doing as well. Abracadabra, though, only 23% trash. Of course, they have the death on the board and they're now only at 35% on Sky Captain Craig. Swankfist is getting down to 9% HP there. So uh, that's just what I'm saying. The danger of the one-shot potential on this boss yeah. very high. Yeah, so teams even using their, their defensors preemptively. We just saw the last stand being used there for a nerf tank as well before the shot came out just to make sure that uh, in case a person gets hit that doesn't have any defensives ready, is able to survive it. And unfortunately, they're all getting the, the goo as well in melee range here for Method and A. Uh, a little bit luckier on Abra's side, maybe smoke a little bit better at um, baiting it as well here. So as long as you do, don't get the goo, you should be fine on 100%. Lighty unfortunately going down here, but thankfully this at the very end of the boss, so he can just release and spawn there. About five seconds on the board now for Method and A as well. Yeah, and one advantage, I suppose, at least small advantage that Abracadabra does have on this boss is you're going to get more damage out of Smock at sitting at a range from the healer. He's doing about uh, 16, 17k, whereas uh, JB only did about 5k, because all, all he can really do is Crackling Jade Lightning just by sitting outside by himself, trying to bait all of the parrot poop down. So, bit of an advantage, allowing Abracadabra to slowly catch up, but I mean, they're still 8% behind on Trash. They're going to need to do an even more aggressive pull with Trash later on, something that they just can't out class Method and A right now because Method and A has two unholy DKs so they're going to need to hope that Method and A has some screw-ups because they are not going to beat Method and A at clearing trash faster in this dungeon. They might have a single target advantage but that's really where it stops. Yeah and Mistweaver really being so much better than Rastidude when it comes to those huge pulls just because a Mistweaver can pop their cooldowns and just do 200k HPS so you don't even have to bother for a couple of seconds with uh, with the Mistweaver just popping their CDs as well. And now you see Abra did finally manage to get across the bridge to and down the first boss. Uh, they are on 23%, Method and A already on 32 at this point, though. And, and now we will see how they deal with those trash pulls. And again, there's just no way for Abra to do bigger... Uh, bigger pulls than, than Method and A does because of the different comps. So they need to make up their time by, I don't know, having a better strategy, being more efficient with their route. But we already saw Method and A's strategy and it was really fast. It was really fast. And here it is again, Method and A with a giant trash pull on top of the boss. That unholy battery is going to funnel into single target damage on Captain Rule and Captain Jolly. Most of the trash that they pulled is already dead, putting them up to 44%. And the two bosses are at an average of 75% health between the two of them. Avery Cadaver doing a, a pretty substantial trash pull here, has not yet pulled the boss. Finally, they pull the boss now, and they're going to hope to get a lot out of Ashine as they try to cleave down the trash. A lot of danger coming in here, though, for Divinefield as he pops his shield wall, just tries to stay alive. He has no other cooldowns available. Zmox Iron Bark is down as well. So after this, that trash needs to die, and it does, just because of the unholy DK's damage. <laughs> yeah, he actually went up to 1.8 million DPS here for Abakidabra side, so these are the kind of pulls that they have to do. They need to pull all of this trash on top of the boss, and you see they actually keep chaining. So this there's one mob that is deceived there in the corner with an incap by Swagfist, which uh, probably is a caster, so they don't want to deal with that, but you still have um, you still have the Bacchanese that are getting gripped in. Oh, it's a, it's a Brime skill, yeah. So they now gripped it in on top, and this is something that it actually works really nice, very efficient to just constantly chain mobs on top of the boss here because there's the, the friendly brews, uh, the positive brew buffs on the floor that can give you haste or crit. It can also give a negative debuff of damage over time effect if you, send, if you put the mobs inside of it, which can help you out as well. 
it can help you out indeed. And it's actually really quite crucial uh, for playing the boss properly and getting as much, uh, and just killing it as quickly as possible. Now, the relative advantage you gain from the positive bruise versus the negative brew going on top of the boss is actually quite small. So you, you actually want as much, many of those negative brews to spawn for two reasons. One, it does a substantial amount of damage to the bosses. And two is that Captain Raul is often stationary because he's casting Barrel Smash. And by doing so, you can't really get in there to get good brews and often brews are cast on him. So he just naturally gets a ton of damage if those bad brews spawn on top of him. Uh, Abracadabra now down to almost 10% between the two bosses as Method and Ace finish that up. They're tied for trash percentage now. So huge pulls here for Abracadabra. And it was really key for them to keep chaining the trash on top of the bosses. But Method and Ace still ahead as they're mass stealthing over to the uh, Ring of Booty and getting ready to deal with a lot of trash. Yeah, the, the one thing to note is that uh, Avra, Avra had the chance to watch Method and Ace freehold strategy yesterday. And this is the first game they played today, Avra. So they had uh, they had a lot of time, basically, to look at Method and Ace strategy and look how they can beat their time. Because uh, that's the second game they're playing in their upper bracket, and it's really important for them to stay in the upper bracket. Wh whichever team wins this game has so much more time to prepare for the grand final. Because whoever loses goes down to a lower bracket, needs to play another game there and then straight from the losers final into the uh, grand final meaning that there's a lot less time to practice for, the, for for this first place and that's really what matters between those two teams whoever gets the higher seed will secure the second uh, blizzcon spot basically and get the higher seeding so uh, very important to stay in the upper bracket for both of those teams now abra did engage uh, ludwig just now while method and a is already down to approximately 30 percent yeah and ludwig von schnitzel just absolutely melted here for method too because we saw it yesterday in their dungeon. They funneled, once again, all of that unholy damage straight into Ludwig. So by the time most of the trash was dead, he was already at 60, 70 percent, which is huge. They're doing the same thing here over on the side of Abracadabra, but only having one unholy is just, well, it's not as strong as two mm -hmm. uh, in situations like this as Ludwig reaches 50 percent dead already for Method NA as they wait for Trothak to spawn and they're looking at what other trash they can pick up while they wait. Yeah, it really seems like this very first pull that Method and A did just uh, put them so far ahead because Abra, it seemed like Abra did a little bit better even after the first boss, but because Method and A caught up so much time at the very start of the dungeon, that whatever Abra did afterwards didn't wasn't as good as this first pull for Method and A. So Abra is still trying to catch up. They now downed uh, Ludwig, so they're doing very similar pulls as Method and A, just everything a little bit slower and a little bit further behind. Method and A now pulling a lot of trash on top of Trothak, and it seems like Abra wants to do the same. Yeah, and I mean, they want to do the same, but the thing is, outside of the second boss, they just don't have the same power to do it. It, you get some kind of diminishing return, let's say, for having two DKs in these mass AoE situations versus one, but you still kind of edge out way more damage with the double unholy over the single. So it's still a huge advantage for them there. Trothak down to 75% now for Method and A. Uh, the unholy DK is being just a bit greedy as they sit in there into the uh, the Shark Tornado, taking a bit of damage, but wanting to maximize their DPS output on the bosses. Abracadabra combining a bunch of trash similarly on top of Trothak, who's starting to lose quite a bit of HP quite rapidly as long as that trash stays alive but it's going down and the unholy's burst is going to come to an end soon yeah we see uh, the the mist weavers both kiting uh, actually it's one mist weaver and one residue here on abra side they're cutting the sharks trying to do as much damage as possible on the boss while kiting it's difficult because you don't really want to have the shark in melee because the closest target to the shark is going to have aggro and you don't want any of the melee having to run out and Cut it into one of those pulls just because of the damage loss. Uh, the, the DK is actually not that bad to have aggro from the sharks because they can AMS off the damage. So in case something like that happens, there's still that um, defensive that they can use. But unfortunately, Mistweaver is not as good as doing damage when they're away. They can't do any damage actually. They need to be in melee range. While Rastadruids at least can throw some dots and cast some solar rafts. So a little bit more damage coming out of Smog here compared to the Mistweaver. Yeah, and that's one advantage we mentioned at the beginning of the dungeon that they had on Sky Captain Craig as well and something that's manifesting itself here for Trothak. And you could see it because I was just saying, hey, you know, Trothak's already at 70, 75% for Method NA when Abracadabra was just pulling it. And now they're only 2%, 3% apart just because they were able to get so much trash on top of Trothak. Ashan was doing so much damage and they're getting an, an extra bit of gain from Zmok as well on top of it. That's allowing them to stabilize it. Now, of course, another round of uh, cooldowns coming up here for Trothak, uh, for Method NA as they start to rocket ahead on the boss by another uh, 8% or so. So it should put them ahead on the boss, but this is looking to be actually pretty close in the end. The two teams are only 
only a few percent, two percent apart on trash, and it's just going to come down to well, who <laughs> who can pull more on top of uh, Harlan at the very end of the dungeon? Because we're nearing that end soon. Yeah, this is very close between those two. Uh, one more thing I wanted to notice uh, about the unholy is actually not benefiting as much from the from the monk debuff, from the physical debuff compared to compared to the other melee, just because most of their damage is not actually physical, so they would benefit more from a demon hunter magic debuff compared to having the the Windwalker. Unfortunately, Dr. J going down for Abra, so they did have a rest to get him back up. But with those five seconds, on how close this match is, it can really matter at the end. Dude, I just, my heart just skipped a beat. Divine Field dropping to 2% health there. They're just being so aggressive and so greedy, trying to get as much damage, understandably, as on Trothak. They know how close the match is right now. They must be watching the cast as well. But they just had to consume their second battle res there on that attempt. Jay not only procs his cheat death, so he basically died one time, and then he actually got finished off a second time. So really kind of sloppy and aggressive play from Jay there. Cost him an extra five seconds. Method NA already heading across the bridge. They kind of ran past everything. We know they're just going to run right up, and they're going to all mass shadow meld at the top of the stairs with their Night Elf racial. Abracadabra likely to do the same thing, and they're actually ahead by Trash uh, by 1%. Really not a big deal, though, once they move to Harlan because everything is just going to be cleaved down in a frenzy, and both teams are going to grab Harlan, grab the pack on the side, and just cleave everything down. Yeah, so we've seen things go wrong with these skips, and you saw all of those volcanoes spawn from Method and A as they were using their Shadow Melt. So that was very lucky that none of those volcanoes actually spawned underneath them, because in the Shadow Melt you can't move, else you break the Shadow Melt, of course. But no one going down for both of the teams, so well done both of them to be able to get the skip done. And now we see the Bloodlust being popped, and this Trash Pack being pulled on top of Harlan Suite. This is very dangerous for the tanks, just because there's so much tank dam damage happening, especially with the Enforcers just uh, constantly throwing you around and it will uh, matter the most to make sure that you use the artillery properly, the bombardment, uh, to use that friendly damage in your favor as well. But they are already using the artillery before it even came down in the form of unholy DKs. <laughs> Basically killed all of the trash before the artillery even spawned, at least on the side of Meth A because they have two of them, uh, just kind of eking out at around 350k DPS each, uh, whereas Ashine sitting just at 240, of course, is starting to fall off now as all of the targets have been killed. And as a result, Harlan Sweet has gone even further ahead for Meth and they, when both teams generally pulled it around the same time. I and mean, you can see the Bloodlust timers, they're perfectly in sync almost. So Harlan Sweet now behind for Abracadabra just a bit, but we do know they have slightly superior single target damage outside of the unholy battery into the uh, single target. So it, it might help them in the end. Hopefully it will, but keep in mind, and it, it is that close already in this match, they need to win this by over five seconds in order to beat Method NA. Yeah, and I mean, the unholy, really good here at the start of the pool with the, with all the cooldowns, the bloodlust, their army coming in, but then the, the damage drops off quite a bit the longer the fight lasts. So at the very end, once the boss also gets a damage increase on it, uh, in theory, Abra's Calm should be better there at the end, so Sometime they can make up, but to keep going down, that means there's no time advantage anymore. Two deaths for both teams, and now you can slowly see Avra actually uh, catching up in that single target damage. So this is really going to go down to the wire. Really down to the wire, and Shakib Dunk being Shakib dead is the last thing you want to see when the match is this close at the end here. Harlan Sweet separated by one to two percent between the two teams. Trash percentage largely irrelevant because both teams are just mass pulling on top of the cannons right now and they will deal with the Ravager pack hopefully during this boss so they don't spend the time afterwards. Ashon getting clipped there by one of the cannonball barrages as well as Method and A starts to get slightly ahead and pull away yet again with 5-6% to 6 difference. Keep in mind once Harlan Sweet reaches 30% he enters the, fa uh, the final phase of his encounter taking double damage so at that point Harlan Sweet's just going to absolutely melt. Yeah, so we see uh, still 5% boss damage, uh, boss DPS difference just because Abra had to deal with this trash still that Method and A already dealt with. There's still 2% and 3% for both of the teams left that they have to do. But the, the trash mobs are already there for Method and A, while Abra still has to pull them. So just uh, advantage for Method and A, again, as they are uh, uh, below 30% now, and the boss is just going to melt at this point. Yeah, it's going to melt, and uh, the chances of them having another death here is pretty low as most of the trash is dead. They're only going to get one cannonball barrage that so they can just honestly scramble in various directions on, and it looks like they're going to be able to edge out over Abracadabra here and take a sweep on the upper final series. 6% left on Harlan Sweet as the final cannonball barrage comes in for Abracadabra, who's still missing 2% trash, and that is just not enough. Method NA with a huge dominant performance in this series.